Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Mark Sipola from the California Air Resources Board, joined by Mahoyo Fuji, also of the Air Resources Board. Uh, we are staff in the, the cap and trade program. I'm the chief of the, of the cap and trade program in California. Um, and Mahoyo's been working in the cap and trade program on industrial decarbonization for several years. Um, but we're here today to have an initial uh, public discussion on decarbonizing cement use. Um, Senator Becker sponsored uh, Senate Bill 596 last year. It was adopted uh, September, October 2021. And it requires the Air Resources Board to develop a strategy to achieve net zero GHG emissions for cement use in California by 2045. So we are here today to uh, kick off a public discussion of that, start gathering some information. Um, it's not a, you know, this isn't the end, this is just the very beginning. So there's there's a lot more to come. Um, just wanna note, you know, we're talking about cement. It's a key ingredient of our infrastructure. It's an important part of California's manufacturing economy. We're gonna need it to meet our basic needs going forward. We have this goal for net zero emissions by 2045. So we're gonna need to figure out ways to reduce those emissions because we're, this is a material that you know, our society essentially depends on. Um, and you know, right now, manu cement manufacturing emissions in California account for about 2% of statewide emissions. So it's a relatively small uh, portion of the total, but there's an opportunity here to um, really set a, set a path for decarbonizing an industrial sector. Um, right now, the cement plants in California are covered by the cap and trade program. So that means they're subject to mandatory reporting of their greenhouse gas emissions data and, some, and a lot of other information to CARB. Um, and they're also you know, facing those costs associated with, with GHG emissions uh, resulting from their obligations in the cap and trade program. So there is you know, regulatory structure in place for the GHG emissions. Um, and I think what we're looking at with SB 596 is you know, potentially modifications to existing things, potentially new measures that are looking to address uh, emissions associated with cement use. Why? Cement is, you know, it's often discussed as something that's a, a process that is particularly hard to decarbonize. It's, it requires very high temperatures to make kind of Portland cement. Um, over half of the emissions from the cement manufacturing process are not related to fuel use and the heat that's need, but just the natural chemical process liberates carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and, and that makes it, you know, uh, kind of classifies it as especially hard to decarbonize. Nonetheless, there are, you know, options out there that we think um, can be used to reduce those emissions. Um, and that's part of what we're here today. So, you know, we'll be looking at what are those technical approaches for reducing emissions. Um, we we'll want to make progress in understanding the barriers to adopting <laughs> those kind of technical measures that can reduce emissions. And we'll be considering starting to consider measures that'll um, promote earlier adoption of these technologies within California with an eye towards meeting that 2045 kind of net zero emissions target. Um, there's a lot of factors that we'll need to consider. Um, you know, there's uh, emissions within communities, there's emissions leakage concerns, um, the, there's a lot of um, specific, uh, specifically prescribed assessments in SB 596 that we'll be, you know, taking a look at down the road. Um, you know, we are looking for developing a strategy for California, something that works for California, but I think the ideal outcome here is something that you know, 
facilitates implementation of technologies that can be exported throughout the world. So you know, we're working on California, but we're doing it with an eye towards, you know, decarbonizing cement throughout the world and, you know, developing methods and approaches that are exportable beyond our borders. Um, <clears throat> so today, you know, we have convened some speakers. We've got on tap about a three, three and a half hour workshop. That's the plan. Um, it's going to consist of presentation by Mahoyo from uh, CARB staff. And then we're going to, you know, have some additional speakers give some context and perspectives on existing practices, emerging technologies. We have speakers who are doing cement related research with investment perspective with you know, current plant operation perspectives um, and some kind of emerging and newer technologies that might be applicable to the cement sector. Um, we do have a, a, a web page that has the agenda for the workshop today. It also has uh, PDF versions of the presentations that Mahoyo and our external speakers will be uh, speaking from. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, I believe that's in the, in the notice and an email, um, but hopefully the, the, the webpage will be uh, searchable and findable. Um, it's on the CARB uh, webpage. Um, after today, we will be accepting written comments. We'll have a comment docket open. Um, so, uh, we'll be able to direct you to that. Um, again, this is really an initial foray, gathering data, presenting where we are, um, where we need to go, and convening some speakers to um, just start the conversation publicly about you know, how we're gonna get there uh, in terms of achieving net zero GHG emissions from the cement sector um, by 2045. So, um, with that, I, I'm gonna um, first hand uh, the platform over to Mahoyo. Uh, she's gonna give a, an overview, CARB staff overview of the cement sector um, a, and a little bit of background information on Senate Bill 596. And um, we'll follow on with the additional speakers. We may, my preference is gonna be to hold off and have a full discussion at the end of all of the speakers. Uh, there may be opportunity, depending on time, for some kind of quick clarifications at the end of each presentation, but we'll hold the, the fuller, more complete discussion uh, to the end uh, once all the speakers have had an opportunity to present. Um, so with that, uh, Mahoyo, the, the mic is yours. Thank you, Mark. Can everyone see my uh, slides? Okay. It looks good. Okay. So, thank you, Mark. My name is, uh, oh, sorry. My name is Mihoyo Fuji, and I'm the staff in the uh, cap and trade allocation section. As Mark said, I've been primarily working for industrial sectors and have been working closely with cement sector for years. So it's my pleasure to present today to discuss net zero emissions for the cement sector. Uh, today's agenda, I'm going to talk about the overview of SB 596 and California cement sector, and also potential uh, reduction opportunities. And then as Mark said, there will be panel presentations after me, and then Q&A sessions. Uh, when you ask questions, we may be uh, accepting a couple of clarifying questions after, after each presentation. Uh, please use the uh, raise hand function to the GoToWebinar. It should be to your right. And when we call your name, call your name please unmute yourself and uh, proceed to introduce yourself. You can also use the uh, questions uh, box if you would like to write your questions. And you have any technical difficulties during this workshop, please email blame 
morgan at irb.ca.gov. He is helping this uh, run this uh, workshop today. Now let's move on to the overview of SB 596. <clears throat> In September 2021, Governor Newsom signed Senate Bill 596. It requires CARB by July 1st, 2023 to develop a comprehensive strategy for, for cement used in California to achieve a greenhouse gas emissions intensity 40% below baseline levels, which I'll discuss in the next slide, by 2035 and net zero by 2045. The bill also has interim targets to ensure adequate progress is made towards achieving the goal. CARB shall establish interim targets for reductions in the greenhouse gas intensity of cement used within the state relative to the average greenhouse gas intensity during the uh, 2019 calendar year. The interim target is 40% below 2019 level, and it should be achieved by the end of 2035. <clears throat> in the subsequent section, the bill discusses how to establish a base baseline. First, we define a metric and use data submitted to CARB by cement plants under the monetary reporting regulations for the year 2019. We may also need to collect relevant data as appropriate associated with cement imported to the state. By July 1st, 2028, CARB shall evaluate the feasibility of achieving the interim target, which I just mentioned, and may adjust it upward or downward to reflect technological advancement and progress in addressing barriers to the deployment of emissions reduction technologies and processes, including those barriers for which measures have been identified. If CARB makes a downward adjustment to any interim target, CARB shall document the feasibility constraints it has identified and recommend measures and actions, including proposed statutory changes necessary to overcome those constraints to enable the cement sector to achieve net zero as soon as possible, but no later, no later than 2045. So in summary, July next year, complete a, a comprehensive strategy. July, 2028, assessment of the feasibility of the interim target. 2035 is the interim target, which is 40% below the uh, 2019 intensity level. And 2045 is the ultimate milestone to achieve net zero emissions. Uh, let's move on to the comprehensive strategy. Uh, the bill requires CARB to assess exist, uh, the effectiveness of existing measures, identify any modification to them, evaluate the new measures to overcome the market, statutory and regulatory barriers, inhibiting achievement of the objectives. So every 596 casts a wide net to identify effective reduction measures, and we're required to look at the existing programs, such as the cap-and-trade program, as well as exploring new measures. And when doing so, we're required to coordinate with relevant stakeholders, other state agencies, districts, and experts in academia, industry, public health, and with the local communities. In the following sections are more prescriptive provisions. Evaluate measures to support market demand and financial incentives to encourage the production and use of cement with low greenhouse gas intensity, including but not limited to conservation of all the following measures. A, measures to expedite the adoption for use in project undertaken by state agencies, including the Department of Transportation, of Portland limestone cement, and other blended cements. B, measures to provide financial support and incentives incentives for research, development, and demonstration of technologies to mitigate emissions from the cement production with the objective of accelerating industry deployment of those technologies. C, measures to facilitate fuel switching. And D, measures to create incentives and remove obstacles for energy efficiency improvements and waste heat recovery at cement manufacturing facilities. SB 596 also calls to prioritize actions that leverage state and federal incentives where applicable to reduce cost of implementing emissions reduction technologies and processes 
and to increase economic value for the state. Last but not least, uh, the uh, bill requires CARB to identify actions that reduce adverse air quality impacts and support economic and workforce development in communities neighboring cement plants. It also requires us to include provisions to minimize emissions leakage and account for uh, emissions embedded in imported cement. In a similar manner, emissions are accounted for cement produced in the state, such as border carbon adjustment. Now let's move on to the overview of California cement sector. Before I dive in, I'd like to define cement because it can mean different things. For the purpose of today's discussion, cement is a substance made of clinker and other mineral additives, which is primarily used to make concrete. Uh, so you can see that cement starts from raw materials, limestone, clay, and other mineral additives, which are processed with very high heat to make clinker, which is a main ingredient of cement that has sticky property. This prior processing is called calcination and it contributes to most emissions associated with cement. We'll talk more about the manufacturing process later. Clinker is then blended with gypsum before shipped to concrete batch plants. Clinker can be replaced by limestone or substituted by supp supplementary cementitious materials or SEMs and batch plant can blend in more SEMs to finally ship cement to construction sites. When concrete is in use, cement is only uh, 7 to 15 percent in mass, but it's still responsible for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions. And here's the definition of cement CARB uses for monitoring pouring regulations and cap and trade program, which is in line with how industry and other administ administrative bodies define it. <clears throat> Cement means a building materials that is produced by heating mixtures of limestone and other minerals or additives at high temperatures in a rotary kiln to form clinker, followed by cooling and grinding with blended additives. Finish cement is a powder used with water, sand, and gravel to make concrete and mortar. Most common types of cement is called Portland cement or ordinary Portland cement. So oftentimes those three uh, terms are used interchangeably. Portland cement is for concrete conform to the American Society for Testing and Materials or ASTM C150 standard. Type one and two cement is typically considered general purpose cement and used for general construction purposes. Type by is used for um, with uh, when high sulfate resistance is required such as coastal structures. I won't have time to go over the rest, but as you can see, cement is a highly engineered project subject to rigorous standards. And then there's a category called blended hydraulic cement, which is specified by AS team C595. Those types of cement have less clinker than Portland cement, as clinker is partially replaced or substituted by other in ingredients. For example, type 1L, part of clinker is substituted by limestone. We'll be seeing those types of cements more often in the context of SB 596, as they can reduce emissions associated with the clinker production. You may remember that the uh, SB 596 uh, encouraged the use of Portland limestone cement and other blended cements. <clears throat> As most concrete is used for, con uh, so, sorry, most cement is used for concrete, we'll like to review the definition of concrete. Concrete is a, a stone-like construction material that consists uh, of water, excuse me, cement, water, aggregate, and air. Cement binds and hardened concrete, uh, hardens concrete. Again, uh, cement is only 7 to 15% of the, uh, the entire concrete, but it's still responsible for the majority of emissions. Now, uh, let's move on to how Portland cement is manufactured. First, raw materials, limestone, clay, and other mineral, minerals are mined or imported to the site and ground. Cement plants are typically located by limestone curry. Then feedstock stock is introduced to preheater and precalciner, 
then to rotary kilns. This process, which is called calcination, requires high heat, typically close to 1500 degrees Celsius, to make clinker. Fuels with high heat value, such as coal or petroleum coke, are usually used. This is the single largest emission source for cement production, as CO2 is liberated from the feedstock, which is called process emissions, and a high level of combustion emissions are also emitted. After calcination process, clinker is cooled, ground, and blended with about 5% of gypsum. Small amounts of SCMs are also blended at cement plants. In California, further blending occurs at concrete batch plants, which are the main destination of cement made at cement plants. The next slide shows the list of California cement plants. There are eight of them currently. They collectively produced about 10 million metric tons of cement in 2019, emitting about eight uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. As you can see in the map, many large plants are located, lo located in Southern California. <clears throat> One thing I would like to mention is that cement plants are located by limestone curry and they typically shut down operations when limestone reserves become low. And California cement plants are by the major limestone deposit, and they were all built around early to mid uh, 20th century. Although some facilities shut down over the last couple of decades, there has not been any new plants during the same time of period. Next slide shows some uh, statistics about the uh, cement and its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as discussed earlier, limestone liberates CO2 during calcination process, and the process emissions contribute to about 60% of the total emissions. About 5% comes from electricity, and the remainder is due to fossil fuel combustion. The bar graph on the right-hand side shows emissions by fuel type. Blue is coal and petroleum coke. Those are emissions-intensive fuels. Small amount of natural gas is also used, and other fuels, mainly bio-derived fuels, are also being tested. You might have noticed that the large drop in production of emissions in 2009, this is when recession hit the state. Construction is cyclical business and directly affected by economic downturn. It took the cement industry several years to be back to the pre-recession condition. This slide shows greenhouse gas emissions intensity for clinker production, and it has changed. Uh, it's showing a uh, downward, uh, downward declining trend. The intensity is calculated as direct emissions divided by production. Uh, in this case, it's short ton, and electricity is not included here. The bottom orange line is the average of California plants, which have always been lower than the national average. I don't have time to go over the data sources, but please ask questions for more details during the uh, Q&A session. One thing uh, I want to mention is that we use clinker as a denominator here to make sure that the, uh, the comparisons are apples to apples. The next slide is cement shipments and imports. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about it because SP 596 tar uh, sets targets for emissions associated with cement used within the state. Cement used within the state should include both cement produced and consumed in California and cement produced elsewhere and imported to California for final consumption. CARB collect uh, cement emissions and production data from California cement plants, but does not collect consumption nor import export data. So we may have to rely on other data sources when we develop emissions intensity baseline. Um, so the graph shows some examples of data collected by other agencies. The dark and light blue bars are production and shipment for final, cu uh, final customer. And this shipment for final customer could, could approximate consumption. Those data are collected by US Geological Survey. USGS Minerals yearbook collect a good amount of information for cement, and some data are published at state level. So this is a valuable resource. And the red line is the amount of imports through California ports. 
the data is published by the International Trade Commissions. So you may observe that the lower production and consumption are relatively close to each other in California, and the level of imports over the last decade have been somewhere between 3 to 14% of the production consumption level. Obviously, those data are collected based on their own methodologies, so we would like to work with stakeholders to ensure that we'll be selecting appropriate sources if needed, as needed, and all data are consistent to each other. Lastly, with, I would like to review the end use of cement. This is also from USGS Minerals Yearbook. This is for 2018 at the national level. 77% of the cement shipped from cement plants was delivered to ready mixed concrete batch plants. And the rest went to concrete product manufacturers, contractors, uh, material dealers, and other destinations. Now I'm going to move on to potential opportunities for uh, greenhouse gas reductions for cement sector. Um, before that, let me take a step back and go over some important terms used in SB 596 that may need clearer definitions. First, cement. As we discussed earlier, cement is made by blending mineral additives to clinker, and clinker making is the largest source of emissions. We anticipate that the replacing or substituting clinker is going to be one of the key emission reduction options to achieve net zero, so it's important to determine where the final point of blending should be to make cement. Should it be at cement plants or concrete batch plants where more blending occurs? Then there's also potential to make cement from non-limestone feedstock in order to avoid calcination process and associated, associated process emissions. These new types of cement are often called noble cement. Currently, there's no commercial noble cement plants, but it's possible that it, come, it becomes economically viable within the next couple of decades. So we will need to think about how noble cement could fit in the definition of cement. And then SB 596 target cement used within a state. Theori theoretically, it has to be cement produced in California, minus cement produced in California and exported to other states or countries, plus cement produced elsewhere and imported to California for consumption. Currently, there's no publicly available data on interstate goods movement. So we, we would probably have to rely on domestic production data and international trade data. Based on how we define cement, we'll have to collect production and import export data that correspond to that definition. It is CARB's current understanding that interstate cement movement is not significant, but this is something we will also uh, in, like to investigate during the process. Then CARB need to determine a metric for uh, greenhouse gas intensity based on 2019 data. CARB collect scope one and two direct and indirect emissions for, from California cement plants. And lastly, we will need to determine how to quantify net zero. SB 1279, which was passed recently, defines net zero as emissions of greenhouse gases to at the atmosphere that are balanced by removals of emissions over a period of time as determined by CARB. So we will need to determine one, method to quantify emissions from cement sector, and then two, method to identify carbon sinks available for cement sector and measure uh, the CO2 removal from the atmosphere. Now let's move on to reduction opportunities. In a bigger picture, there are two pathways the first one is keep manufacturing conventional Portland cement using limestone as the primary feedstock and process it with the very high temperature by burning uh, high heat value fuels. For process emissions, most reasonable reduction option is to capture it when it's liberated from limestone. The CO2 is then needed to be sequestered if not used for other uh, applications. For combustion emissions, there are a couple of options improve efficiency and heat recovery. This will result in lesser amount of fuel used per unit of production. 
Also, high emission fuels can be replaced by low or zero emissions fuels, such as hydrogen, biomethane, biomass, or waste-derived fuels. It's also conceivable to electrify the entire process and procure electricity from uh, renewable sources. The second pathway to try to reduce the amount of clinker used in cement or make cement from non-limestone sources to avoid process emissions. This could also reduce the amount of heat required for uh, making a uh, manufacturing process, which will reduce combustion emissions. For example, Portland limestone cement can, can be used more aggressively. PLC includes up to 15% of ground limestone, which is not calcined, in, plus, in place of clinker, and blending can occur at cement plants. Caltrans recently approved the use of PLC. So this is considered an option that can be implemented short to midterm. ACMs that have sticky properties can be blended at cement plants or concrete batch plants, plants to substitute clinker. Currently, major ACMs are fly ash, slag, and puzzlons. Mineral fill fillers can also be added when making concrete. And then there are a group of there's a group of materials often called alternative clinker. This group includes, uh, for example, reactive bailite pour on cement that contains similar mineral phases as conventional clinker, but have different prevalence to those phases. So it can lower emissions during clinker making. There are also alternative clinkers with raw materials such as carbonatable calcium silicates. Alkali activated materials are also an option. They use a solid precursor, often SEMs, and alkali activator, and they can act as a cementing binder instead of a clinker. So we'll hear more about those techni the technical details of alternative materials during panel presentations. <clears throat> Indirect emissions from electricity is about 5% of total emissions, and electricity could be produced, uh, procured from renewable sources. One of the important things I'd like to point out here is that the cement is an ingredient to make concrete. There's an extended supply chain or value chain after cement is shipped from cement plants, and players downstream can play critical roles to help achieve the goal of SB596. For example, market acceptance of low cement is a key factor. Also, financial incentives and uh, various forms of support will help the industry to overcome challenges associated with making innovative technologies economically viable. Lastly, uh, I'd like to mention that the, for the purpose of HP 596, emissions reduction have to come from cement and cement-related activities. They cannot come from purchasing offsets from unrelated sectors. So, uh, and finally, I would like to mention that the CARB currently have has an interagency agreement contract with UC Davis to help inform SB 596 process. They're doing the research right now, which is scheduled to be concluded in April next year. They are to identify barriers to implement reduction measures listed here and make recommendations on California-specific policy measures and actions. Dr. Sabi Miller, who is the principal investigator of the project, is set to present later, so we'll hear more details from her. And lastly, uh, the next steps. We will be accepting comments through November. And here's a link to submit comments. Once we review comments, we'll have technical meetings. Uh, SB 596 requires CARB to include uh, representatives from other state agencies, districts, and experts in academia, industry, public health, and with local communities. And the comprehensive strategy has to be completed by July 1st next year. And this concludes my presentation. So if you have any like clarifying questions, I can take them at this point. Thank you, uh, Mihoyo. And 
Yeah, maybe just field uh, a couple quick uh, clarifying questions before we dive into the next speakers. Um, I did see one come in in the, the questions feature in the GoToWebinar, uh, basically asking how this work might fit in with the ongoing work at the federal level with efforts like the National Institute of Standard and Technologies Low Carbon uh, Cements and Concretes Consortium. This was from uh, Nicole Shimizu. Um, I, you know, I think, thank you for flagging this. I think this is something that, uh, you know, this kind of feedback that is going to be very helpful for us. So um, I can't speak to those efforts at the federal level right now, but certainly something that we will want to incorporate into our assessments uh, going forward. So. Thank you for flagging that for us. Um, and, and Bob Epstein is just requesting a clarification that there, there is a plant in uh, Cupertino, California, near the Bay Area, uh, that was uh, shut down recently, maybe a year or two ago, and is currently not operating. So he was just uh, requesting that that be clarified. And I, I'm going to, um, I think, tee up the next, in, unless there are others who have, maybe we have one time for one uh, quick question. If there are hands raised, I'm not sure if there are. Um, I am going to introduce our next speaker um, who, let's see, is Tom Teets. Um, Tom is the executive director of the California Nevada Cement Association, CNCA. CNCA serves these states as a nonprofit association that provides expert technical leadership, research, and educational opportunities. In this role, Tom is actively involved with and oversees CNCA's regulatory, legislative, marketing, and education efforts. He has a Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts degree in Architecture from the University of Illinois, and he has practiced as a licensed architect in the past. Um, I will turn it over to Tom uh, to for his presentation. I can you hear. That sounds hear? better. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Well, sorry about that. I wanted to thank you for the kind introduction and especially want to thank Mihoyo because your presentation was very thorough and you covered some of the basics about cement and concrete that I plan to cover on the early part of my presentation and I will end up skipping through those rather quickly because you did such a good job. But I wanted to start my presentation this morning by thanking Senator Josh Becker and his staff. They were especially dedicated to coordinating input, not only from the cement industry, but also from the Natural Resources Defense Council in the creation of Senate Bill 596, which is a bill that we are very excited about and we're supportive of all the way through. We thank the governor for signing it last fall, and we believe it is a fundamental part of helping our industry reach very aggressive goals by reaching net zero by 2045. So I'll go through a few slides. As I mentioned, I will uh, quickly, here we go, quickly uh, describe the context of uh, the cement industry in California. Uh, this information is really, it comes right from CARB's website. It shows the 2019 greenhouse gas emissions by scoping plan subcategory. And you can see cement up in the upper left-hand corner. So often when you hear about cement, it's usually in a global context. So uh, as, as Bob Met Epstein mentioned, there's now uh, seven operating cement plants in California. In 2019, there were eight. So we expect that uh, percentage, 1.9% to have decreased slightly since uh, 2019. But uh, we have seven cement plants out of what I, I recently heard a speaker say, there's nearly 3,000 in the world. And what's unique about this bill is that it's focused on cement 
produced specifically in California at those seven cement plants and includes provisions for the cement being imported primarily from Asia into our market here. So that, that presents the, uh, the, the context. I also think it's worth noting the fact that cement is the product listed here. Cement, uh, as we learned in Mihoyo's presentation, is an ingredient of concrete, but typically makes up more than 80% of the greenhouse gas impacts. Cement in California is then sold to well over hundreds of concrete producers and uh, cement suppliers. Uh, and, and I also wanted to mention that that's why cement is the uh, regulated entity with those seven cement plants creating this uh, amount of CO2 greenhouse gases in the state. Uh, we, we're the regulated entity that's been working collaboratively with CARB since the inception of AB 32 back in 2007. I'll move on uh, and really skip through this process because Miho Mihoyo covered much of this in her introduction. I'll stop at this slide because it shows just a slightly different percentage of process emissions specific to California, but uh, this, this is just a depiction of a cement kiln. As I mentioned, there's seven of these in California. This is what's happening inside of a kiln where there's those process emissions that are really difficult to decarbonize. And we'll talk about, much like Mihoyo did, about how we envision addressing both the process emissions and emissions from the fuel sources required to create that heat. To do this, uh, I want to mention that our association created a carbon neutrality plan last year. It has one bold goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2045, three pathways and nine levers. And I'd like to describe that plan and also feature one of these levers that we feel is advancing because I think it's a good case study for how we can make progress. This next slide is perhaps the most important one in my slide deck, and it echoes some of the things you've already seen this morning. So if we look at uh, our pathway number one, it's really focused on those process emissions. We heard about Portland limestone cement. That's the one that's making progress right now. And carbon capture use and storage is listed next. It is the most important one for our industry to reach the, the goals that we're pressing for in 2045. You can also see the same sort of things already mentioned in terms of alternative raw materials, alternative cements and clinkers. But uh, in this case, we're gonna focus this morning primarily on those first two. You also see uh, pathway number two addressing combustion emissions and fuel switching. This is an area where in California, we see opportunities to catch up with other parts of the world, which are making uh, vast progress in this area as well as other states. So we are looking forward to introducing a ways to remove, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels while not uh, increasing our emissions in any way at the tail end. Also included are a few things like waste heat recovery and on-site renewables. I mentioned waste heat recovery as an example of another technology that we see employed in, in much of the world, but not here yet. Uh, and that really speaks to really the first two columns in this chart. So if you look at the first column, we have identified that six of these nine levers require some sort of legislative assistance to reach our goal and to accelerate the pace of change. That is exactly why we were supportive of this bill and are looking forward to coordinating with its adoption through CARB. Then you can see that eight of these nine require some sort of regulatory assistance. So here is where we think implementing Senate Bill 596 can really address some of these core barriers that we see to making success happen. This next slide takes a look at each of those nine levers and gives uh, an idea of the timing that we envision for each of them and their overall impact. So in the case of Portland limestone cement, you see that's a near-term example, carbon capture use and storage, which is essential for us to meet 2035 and 2045 goals is long-term and you can see its impact can make up more than 50% of the total. So in the meantime, we are eagerly and ambitiously looking for ways to advance acceptance of each of these levers as we move forward. 
And this is again why we think Senate Bill 596 is so vital. And I wanted to emphasize that this is something that we were enthusiastic about and supportive of all the way through the legislative process. And again, look to uh, thank Josh Becker and his staff for this landmark bill, which is the first in any California sector focusing on achieving net zero emissions. What I'd like to do next is just take an example of one of these levers, and it's Portland limestone cement. It's a blended cement, which uh, we see already starting to make an impact with uh, inf information that uh, I'm happy to share that uh, Caltrans has since uh, the passage of Senate Bill 596 adopted. So it took them a while, but uh, you can see the reference in Senate Bill 596 to uh, focus on this, particularly with the Department of Transportation. And you can see in the green below that uh, we, we've got a press release from Caltrans in January where uh, the director mentions that using a lower carbon cement can cut Caltrans concrete carbon emissions annually by up to 10%, which is a big step for them. And I wanna mention that this is quantifiable. So you, may, you see in the quote below that, that uh, they see the potential just within the Caltrans use of concrete to reduce about 28,000 tons of CO2 per year. This gives a, a slide, gives an overview of the, a bit of the history on Portland limestone cement. Ironically, it's been used in Europe since the 1960s, approved in North America in 2007, 2012, 2017, various national standards were created. It's also permitted, as you can see below, in many national standards, such as the Federal Aviation Administration, the Uniform Guide Specification, which is used by all the Department of Defense, and other national codes. So in the upper right, you can see that Caltrans completed a three-year study looking at 13 performance characteristics specific to California materials. That research showed that Portland limestone per cement performed equal or better than ordinary Portland cement. And now that standard is in place, it can be used on all Caltrans projects. And the reason I mention Caltrans in particular here is that Caltrans is usually, and not usually, always viewed as the primary market signal in the state of California for what can be produced and accepted not only for Caltrans work, but for other agencies throughout the state and even in the private sector. Many engineers we talk to, they say, they'll tell us, well, if, if Caltrans has approved it, that's good enough for me. So the impact goes just beyond the state agency. And I want to provide one example of a project at University of California, San Diego. You're looking here at a drone shot of the North Torrey Pines Living and Learning Center completed in August of 2020. In the case of UC San Diego, they've been a pioneer in using Portland limestone cement even before Caltrans approval. And what's notable, again, is that this is measurable and it's happening. So if you look at the upper right portion of the screen, you can see the data from Cal Portland, which is the cement producer of this concrete in uh, this project. You can see from their environmental product declaration, their typical type 2.5 cement, versus the environmental impacts of Portland limestone cement, created about a 10% improvement in the overall impact of that concrete used. So what you're looking at in this specific project with these dormitories, classrooms, and office buildings, all of the concrete that you see in the columns, the walls, the floors is using this material and saved over 3,000 metric tons of CO2 just on this one project. And here's an example of that project up close. As we sit today, there are thousands of students walking around campus at this living and learning center, living and learning as we speak, and it's real. And what we recognize is that this is a tangible way of looking at a lever that is succeeding. And it's succeeding because it has state agency support and it has the technical background that's been approved through standards, not just nationally, but here in California. So CNCA, it's been our major mission in the past year and a half to do education outreach, to make sure that agencies and public entities 
are utilizing this product and moving towards a market transition away from ordinary Portland cement to this product. And we estimate that that's, we're about 15 to 20% of the way there right now. And when that's accomplished, we could be making a reduction of around 850,000 metric tons of CO2 annually. And I'll conclude with just this last slide where there's some key excerpts from Senate Bill 596 that we feel can help accelerate the pace of change. If we look at the pace of change, even Portland limestone cement, it took more than four years just to get that through the Caltrans research and approvals. That's, and Cal, by the way, Caltrans was the 38th state in America to approve it. So other markets are, are beyond where we are today in the US. So if we look at these key excerpts, I'd like to just look at these before I conclude. We recognize that there's a wide range of commercially available technologies and practices that exist to reduce and remove emissions of greenhouse gases throughout the life cycle of cement and concrete production and use. But these technologies and practices face a series of market and regulatory barriers hindering their deployment. And this next part in the middle of this, the screen here really emphasizes why we feel like the collaboration moving forward with CARB is so so essential in making this progress. Where it says the state board shall document the feasibility constraints that the, the board has identified and recommend measures and actions, including proposed statutory changes necessary to overcome those constraints to enable the cement sector to achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. And lastly, another part that we do feel is important because California is exposed to imports, and we believe that number is, is close to 20% today in, in California, with most of those imports coming from Asia, is that this would include provisions to minimize and mitigate potential leakage and account for embedded emissions of greenhouse gas emissions in imported cement in a similar manner to emissions of greenhouse gas emissions for cement produced in California, such as through a mechanism like a border carter adjustment. So I just want to emphasize that we find these particular excerpts especially important as we move forward, working with CARB to employ Senate Bill 596, and look forward not only to the dialogue that we have this morning, but continued collaboration with CARB that uh, we, you know, I guess, feel like that's so, so essential in moving forward. And thank you again for this opportunity this morning. Thanks, Tom. Um, really appreciate your presentation and, and comments. Um, I, you know, the the PLC example, Portland limestone cement example, I think is, you know, instructive. I, I think it's um, it, a it's good to hear that there's all you know the sector is already thinking about approaches to reduce emissions. Um, but we, you know, I think a lot of people will view a change like this as relatively straightforward. But as you just illustrated, there's a lot of lead time and coordination, um, even for something you know that may be uh, standard practice in other parts of the world. Um, it, it, it's a lot of effort to uh, work towards that transition, and it's not just a matter of any one entity making a decision but it's really a, a kind of all levels of the, the government and, and um, different agencies that really need to be coordinated and thinking about these kind of long-term things. So the fact that, you know, there's a, a lot of effort there already, um, appreciate that that's kind of getting the ball rolling and that, um, you know, people are thinking about these uh, in the con these kind of actions in the context of achieving GHG reductions. Um, a couple notes, I, I just wanna make sure that everyone's aware there, I believe in the chat is a link. Again, uh, it goes to a web page that does have PDF versions of all of the slides that you'll be seeing today. Um, so uh, that's available to you. Um, and maybe just one or two quick questions for Tom that I see in the chat. Not totally sure if you'll be able to speak to these, um, but 
I see a question from Jennifer Border, uh, who's asking, is the PLC more expensive? Um, and you know what is what's the cost difference in terms of percentage? Um, I'm not sure if that is meaning to produce or, or from the customer perspective, but um, Tom, you might be the the person on on the panel that might be in a best position to speak about that. I'm not sure if you have any response to that. Well, I do, and that's a question we get quite frequently. And the answer that I have is that within the cement producers that are making this material in California, they have told me that there is not a cost difference in producing PLC versus ordinary Portland cement. Downstream, once you start talking to concrete producers that may need to make accommodations at this point, that may cause some change downstream, but we don't have any control over that. But ultimately, we view this as becoming the mainstream product throughout the state. And there's a, another question uh, coming from Gary Latshaw, just asking for a description of the chemical difference between Portland limestone cement and Portland cement. Sure, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that. So what the difference is, in ordinary Portland cement, you're allowed to intergrind up to 5% limestone, which happens at the tail end of the production process. With Portland limestone cement, you can now intergrind up to 15%. So there's that 10% of interground limestone that can be added at the tail end of the production. And what it does, it eliminates that amount of limestone from having to go through that calcination process. So it specifically addresses those process emissions. So if you eliminate all that heat that's required to essentially melt limestone, uh, and, and take 10% of that out of the system, that's where we're making the savings. And I'll mention quickly that that inner ground limestone is ground finer than the Portland cement, which is part of the reason why its performance is so positive. Great, uh, thanks so much, uh, Tom, for uh, the presentation. <clears throat> Just wanna check in, will you be available uh, later on at the end for the discussion set? Uh, session. I'll be here the whole time, and that limestone used in Portland limestone cement is a, is already available at the cement plants using the same equipment they already have. It's, it's a relatively simple fix or adjustment. Wonderful. Um, and so we will. Um, there's a, a couple more questions coming in, but we'll look to field those uh, down the road during the the discussion session at the end of the workshop. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Tom. And we're going to do, uh, I believe, one more speaker before we take a break uh, for a few minutes. Um, do I have Eric uh, Chusowitz in uh, on? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Uh, let me do a, a quick introduction of Eric, uh, who will be our second uh, speaker from outside of CARB, and really appreciate his participation here, um, not in California, but uh, uh, outside, but uh, weighing in from afar. Um, Eric is, uh, Eric Trushevich is a specialist in industrial decarbonization, especially cement and concrete. He's worked as on the topic as an entrepreneur in residence at the Clean Tech Venture Capital Fund, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and as a fellow at Stanford University. He also has a decade of experience in the cement industry in a variety of roles, <clears throat> a variety of executive roles across Europe and the United States. Eric holds a master's degree in management from Stanford University Grad School of Business and a bachelor's degree from Yale University. So I will invite Eric to uh, present his overview. And again, thank you and welcome. Wonderful, thanks Mark for the introduction and, and it's a real honor to present here at CARB. I'm just gonna try to figure out how to share my screen here. So yeah, like I said, thanks for the honor of 
you know, kind of presenting here at, uh, at CARB, I'm really, really happy to see, you know, how California is trying to move forward really aggressively on the topic of cement decarbonization. Um, that's a topic that I've been working on for, for quite a while. And I think um, there's many things that can be done. And this type of um, government support to do so is, is really critical to get things to move forward. So, um, so thanks. I guess we can just go to the uh, first slide here. So I'll go very quickly through this because I think may I just joined for this session, but you may have already seen some of this. So you know, cement is is uh, around more than four billion tons of production. You know, around seven percent of uh, global CO2 growing um, problem. You know, so this four billion tons of uh, production is going to grow, and and the emissions are going to grow unless we find a new technology solutions. Um, you know, by 2050 for for decarbonizing the sector. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, super capital intensive process, um, the production of cement, so it's normally done in plants that are producing a million or more tons a year. Um, cement plants are normally going to cost between two and four hundred million um, dollars a year, depending on where and what scope you're looking at. There's about only about 2,500 cement plants in the world because it's a extremely um, capital intensive a process, that, which is on a large scale. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just a little bit um, so people can understand the scale of production of cement. So here you can see, I guess no one can see my, no, I can't point on the slide either, but you can see little cars in a parking lot, you know, in this in this first um, thing down there. And you can see a little thing that looks like a matchstick, which is actually like a 60 or 70 meter long um, kiln, red matchstick in the, in the center of this thing. Um, so it's really a massive, massive industrial installations that we're talking about. On the right, you have, you know, limestone and clay. Um, tens or hundreds of thousands of tons of raw materials and stockpiles and then moving through this a uh, cement process heating up and becoming clinker and then becoming cement so thanks if you can move to the next slide um, cement also is a deceivingly simple looking material so it looks like a gray powder um, but it's actually a fairly complex material um, you know, it's four phases of primarily calcium silicate materials, so calcium, tricalcium silicate, a dicalcium silicate, so <clears throat> dicalcium silicate, tricalcium aluminate, and tri tetracalcium alumina ferrite. You know, with the production of cement, you can see, and probably you've covered it prior to the production of um, a bunch of CO2 just directly coming off of limestone, which is calcium carbonate, which you can see here in the center of this um, phase diagram, how, how CO2 is exiting the process. Um, and you also really need to control um, the production of cement so you have the proper proportions of these different phases of material so it's a reactive um, clinker that can then be co-ground with gypsum to produce a, a cement that, that is really a uh, valuable thing. So it looks like a very simple gray material, but it's actually a fairly complex material um, and it, it, you need very high temperatures to produce at around 1500 Celsius. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, probably the most important consideration for all technology innovation in the cement sector is that cement is extraordinarily cost optimized material. Um, so producing a ton of cement, you know, can be a variable cash cost of production of, you know, between four, 20 and $40 a ton. I think in California, it's, it's likely a bit higher than this. Um, in the U.S., I think it's, you know, towards the higher end of this range. It depends what you count, but um, that variable cash cost of production is extraordinarily optimized. Um, this is a, a process that, you know, over many, many, many years has become a, really the lowest cost po possible process. And it's a local commodities market. So, you know, being at that, that variable cost, the variable cost is the most important factor in the production of cement is to be able to produce at the lowest possible variable cost so you can be competitive in these local commodities markets. And this is something that when we think about innovation, um, and technology innovation for CO2 reduction, we really have to have front and center of our thinking on the sector. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me if I'm losing my voice a little bit here. Um, main source of a, oh, I don't see the presentation anymore. There we go. Main source of a CO2 emissions is just the decomposition of limestone, calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and CO2. 
Kara says 50% is probably more 55 or 60% by now. The other primary source of emissions is combustion of primarily fossil fuels to produce the energy um, needed to increase the temperature of the material to, you know, through the calcination at 900 degrees and then um, to the sintering at around 1450 Celsius to produce um, clunker. So that's, that's where the CO2 is coming from. Next slide, please. Okay, um, 2019 was really a tipping point for the industry globally in terms of um, how CO2 was perceived by the global cement industry. Um, so until uh, 2019, it was maybe one of the priorities. In Europe, it was a little bit of a priority because they had a, a cap and trade market, but it wasn't really, I would say, the top thing that's on the mind of a CEO of a cement, um, multinational cement company. And really in 2019, a combination of factors made it so it jumped way up to be the you know, one of the top three issues probably for most of the, the executives at the top level of multinational cement companies. Um, and that's because you had open letters from shareholders and holders of capital to the cement industry um, really highlighting the issue with CO2. Um, the cement industry looked a, a little bit at the um, oil and gas and other fossil fuel industries and understand that it understood that if it didn't decarbonize, its cost of capital would increase. And then you had um, across the globe, the proliferation of additional areas where it looked like CO2 was going to have a cost to emit, you know, so in California, um, there's some cost to that and then became, you know, in Canada, there's costs and, you know, across Europe and a, I think in Korea and in Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, there started to be additional a carbon taxes applicable to that. So really the cement industry kind of changed its tact and really got more aggressive on this. Next slide, please. Um, that resulted, so the sector had a plan for decarbonization, which I, I think was something around a 40% reduction. I, I don't remember exactly, but it was a substantial reduction by 2050 that the industry was planning. So the industry redid its plan. I can't actually see the right side of the slide. Um, um, the industry redid its plan to be more aggressive and to try to find a net zero emissions pathway to 2050. I think this was done last year. Um, and that net zero pathway, if you look at it, and again, I can't really point out, but if you look at 2030 here, um, you see there's some reductions until 2030 and then a much more aggressive um, reduction uh, coming from 2030 to 2050. A lot of that is, you know, innovative technologies that don't really exist at scale now, including carbon capture. Um, so when you look at this, you really uh, kind of understand that um, it would be good for us to try to accelerate that as much as possible, which, like I said, having California involved in pushing this more aggressively, I think can only be good for the development of those technologies that the whole industry is, is really waiting for um, by 2030 to, to pursue more aggressively. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so in my own work here, and I'll, I'll try to accelerate this a little bit. I'm not sure how far off timing I was because because of the start, but it, I'll try to go quickly through this. Um, when I think about technology innovation in the, in the sector, I just first try to divide that into categories for, you know, understanding a little bit what kinds of innovation there are. Here I, here I just simply divide it into material, energy, and capture, and then some subcategories. Next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit of an overview. So a couple of years ago when I first um, started to really deep dive this a sector, I, I first tried to look and see what innovations did exist that were um, both well-known and, and unknown to others, you know, outside of the sector. And when I looked, I was actually surprised uh, by the extent to which there is innovation in the sector. Um, so you have under energy capture and, and really a lot of um, under material of innovations that are you know, in, in different pockets in the cement industry or in at different scales in the cement industry or um, from other companies being explored, but they're not, not a lot of them have scaled to be high impact technology. So I posed myself the question of, you know, what kind of characteristics would a high impact, scalable, feasible technology need um, to impact the cement industry globally on on uh, an important scale of CO2? Next slide, please. Um, so in that in that 
um, kind of question to myself, you know, these are four characteristics that I came up with um, that I always look at, technology innovation in the sector um, to try to determine feasibility based on these four characteristics. So the first one is, you know, the availability of an enormous quantity of widespread available and very cheap raw materials. Um, so raw materials for cement, um, you know, the, the primary raw material by weight is around 80% limestone in current OPC. That costs sometimes, you know, around five dollars a ton. That's that's a fairly common estimate, you know, between four and seven dollars a ton at the door of the cement plant. Um, it's usually, you know, there's usually a, a limestone quarry next to a cement plant, and being able to have these widespread available uh, materials very, very cheaply um, to produce four billion tons of cement or more than four billion tons of cement is a first and primary characteristic to look for in new technologies. Um, the second is really the economics of what happens in this price sensitive local commodities market. Again, variable cost is the king. Um, so what is the impact of that technology on the variable cost of production is extremely important. Adjusted, of course, if there's a strict CO2 regime that gives CO2 reductions a benefit, um, but really to say, okay, you need to, you need to not be increasing very importantly the variable cost, if at all possible with these new technologies. The third one is really, <clears throat> what are the implications for CapEx um, related to this technology? So um, what is what is the fit with incumbent infrastructure? There's around a trillion dollar trillion dollars of capital stock globally, you know, a trillion dollars of invested in capital stock of the cement industry globally. I mean, it's really controlled by um, corporations that have a huge amount invested in that capital stock. So in, as much as you can be synergistic um, with that capital stock and you know enable that capital stock to produce lower carbon materials, that's a very good and very beneficial thing. Um, and then fourth is you have to produce a material that is easy to use, um, that um, that material can be understood by regulations or you know, is as close as possible to existing cement, either ordinary Portland cement or blended cements. Um, so it's understood by regulations, it's understood by insurance companies, by construction companies, could be used easily, et cetera. So that's really the ease of use of the material. And I look at these four as a process um, so one really what goes into the process, the raw materials, four is what comes out and two or three or two and three are what happens in the process, you know, both the variable and the CapEx impl implications of that. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so the first, the in and the out, I really put into um, a vector of industrial, I, I just classified in my own mind as a vector of industrial feasibility. If you click through to the next slide, it'll appear. And then if you click again, there'll be another one that appears. Um, so the first, yeah, the in and the out are a vector of industrial a feasibility. And then, you know, what happens to the process and the economic or the financial implications of that. That's the economic feasibility. Next, please. Um, so again, a couple of years back when I when I started um, looking into the sector deeply, I came up with this framework. And here's a little slice of the sector. Um, I, I don't pretend that it's comprehensive. I also don't think, you know, necessarily the positions of each of these technology areas are always the same. They change over time with technology innovations and, you know, they, they can be debated where they are, but these are four that I saw at that time were could be very impactful and scalable into the industry and hopefully could be also useful for um, California to decarbonize. Um, so those are these four here, process capture, new generation SEMs, um, binder efficiency and new generation process controls. Um, and we'll start with binder efficiency. If you could go to the next slide. I don't know if it's very slow. Can you go sorry, to the next yeah. slide? Or, or I, sorry, I can't see yeah, the slides. It is, it is very slow. It seems to take a few seconds after I hit next until yeah. it actually shows okay. for everyone. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Okay, um, so a binder efficiency, yeah, I can see it now. Um, okay, uh, so binder efficiency is just a super simple idea that there's too much cement in concrete. Um, there doesn't necessarily need to be that much cement in concrete to give uh, a performing equal compressive strength material. Um, and so that's really about, you know, how do you reduce the interparticle space in the concrete, concrete matrix? How do you how do you look at the microstructure and instead of filling up um, the interparticle space with CSH, 
calcium silicate hydrate or you know other reaction products of binders how do you fill them up potentially with particle size optimized fillers and it's really the same concept if you've ever seen a video of you know someone putting trying to put marbles and sand and water or, or different things in a jar it's really how do you fill up that interparticle space there's a whole bunch of additional interparticle space and if you use particle size optimized inert fillers um, you can do that with a lower specific emissions material than you know if you're always using binders to fill up that space next slide please um, when you do that you oftentimes will have some um, issues around gradation dispersion workability of the material um, but these are increasingly solvable using different types of admixtures so you can um, produce a material with particle size optimized inert fillers with a much lower binder content and you can use admixtures to kind of control these um, issues that you'll have at the final concrete. Um, I don't believe I've included in here but there's a, a very I think it's it might be in the footnote but um, there's a very comprehensive body, body of research <clears throat> by a Brazilian professor named Vanderlei John on this which really shows that you can have radical reductions of binder to the order of around 50% or more in certain applications and certain compressive strengths. So this is something that is, you know, it can lower the cost of those final materials. Um, you need to keep an eye on, you know, how robust are those materials resilient over time. They have less free calcium hydroxide, so they carbonate more rapidly, et cetera. But, you know, if you control for those factors, you can really find um, how do you radically reduce the cement content of concrete in certain cases. Next slide, please. So the second area I would like to highlight is just the next generation of supplementary cementitious materials. And hopefully you've covered a little bit in this what are supplementary cementitious materials, but it's just um, ordinary Portland cement is this clinker, um, which goes through the kiln plus gypsum. And then if you co-grind with it, other things, I think you were just talking about uh, Portland limestone cement. So you can co-grind limestone with it to reduce some of that. Um, you can co-grind other uh, industrial byproducts like fly ash or slag. You can co-grind um, pozzolans, or you can even activate things like calcined clay um, or activate certain types of kaolinite clay to produce calcined clay. Um, that is, you know, these are these are existing, and I would say cal calcined clay is one of the first emerging um, a SEMs, new new class of SEMs that could be very impactful. Next slide, please. Um, so when you're looking around for these two types of ASCMs, there's a whole bunch of uh, different types of materials that um, could be potentially useful for this. Um, but what you're really looking for a lot of the time is amorphous silica, um, calcium or other metal oxides that are reactive, and you know a large scale availability of, of the product and a consistency of content you know, so that you can use this consistently in material and get consistent properties in the final cement. And, you know, some of those materials are more heterogeneous than others. There's a whole host of um, companies and people looking at different beneficiation techniques, physical, thermal, chemical beneficiation techniques um, for these kind of materials to produce a consistent quality reactive material that you can blend. And, you know, some I've listed here some of the sources that people are looking at, but I think this is a, an area that you know, has a lot of interest, has a lot of potential. So um, next slide, please. Um, carbon capture always comes up with cement um, because the if at the global level you produced all cement with green, a green electricity or hydrogen or, you know, with non-fossil sources, you'd still have an enormous amount. I think it's 1.8 or 1.9 billion tons of CO2 emissions. So um, really, a lot of people feel that carbon capture has to be part of that solution. There's other solutions, you know, people people think about, but carbon capture is often brought up. One of the main issues with carbon capture is the parasitic energy load um, that carbon capture implies if you do a post-combustion capture. So if at the end of the cement plant, you have mixed up the combustion emissions with the process emissions from the material itself, it takes a lot of energy to unmix them um, and or it takes either thermal energy a lot of the time if you have a sorbent that you need to regenerate or it can take electrical energy if you're going to try to do oxy combustion um, to get all the oxygen that you need to get a pure stream of co2 so those are some of the the barriers um, because they increase the variable cost of cement and also if you did that at scale in the cement industry you could even 
potentially double the energy conservativity of the sector. Um, so that that's a real barrier for this. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the, the interesting things you can do just because of the nature of the material in the cement industry is because so much of that emission comes from the raw material itself, you can indirectly calcine the material to produce um, what's called process separation. And that process separation is creating a pure stream of CO2 <clears throat> and not letting it get commingled or mixed with the combustion emissions. Um, so that pure stream of CO2 is capturable at a much lower cost or energy um, for the for for a, for that section of a the cement emissions the process emissions next slide please um and then the last area of the, just these four that I've chosen to highlight is you know there's there are next generation digital process controls that can be implemented in cement so a cement factory is oftentimes I like to give the analogy it's simple it's sort of like a 747 that's flown by the wire a bit you know it does have digital control systems etc but oftentimes operators have varying levels of um, knowledge of the process they're operating um, based on handbooks or or guidelines of other operators, you know, they're humans, they they can leave the room and come back, et cetera. But if you have a much closer control of a, the cement production process, you know, there's been studies done that show in actual examples of doing this on a operating cement plants where you can bring down that um, energy conceptivity of the process by 10 or 15 percent. So that's another um, really interesting thing. Next, next two slides you can go through a bit quickly. Um, they just show different models for kiln and for the mill, you know, how you could use machine learning to optimize just from one particular company in the sector that, that works on real-time optimization. So you can continue. Thanks. And next slide after that. Um, so those were the kind of four technologies I thought would be interesting to highlight. There's a lot of others. I, I know, you know, new generation SCMs, uh, I think Brimstone is speaking a little bit later. They have ideas for where to produce SCMs in California. They're based in California. Another company based in California, which is working on SCMs, is a company called Forterra that, that um, tries to produce a, an SCM a, by recapturing a carbon dioxide onto calcium oxide in a different a phase or a different form. So there's interesting things happening in California on that. In the US, there's uh, also other companies that are trying to activate silicates um, to create, produce these ozonic materials like Terra CO2. So there's a lot of innovation on that, especially um, going on in the United States now and, and a couple of companies in California. Um, and if you could just go to the next slide. Um, and then, you know, a few of the other emerging areas that I think are, are very, very, have a high impact are, um, the production of a cement using intermittent renewable electricity. Um, so um, another company from California, Rondo Energy, will be speaking I think later in this conference also. And that's really about how do you take intermittent renewable electricity to very high temperature industrial heat, um, which hasn't really been feasible um, to do economically before. But um, Rondo is working on that. And, you know, there's a there's a host of companies working on um, trying to figure out how to electrify cement process. So that's one of the interesting um, things that's happening in the sector also. Um, the production of biogenic solid fuels from methanogenic high moisture content wastes. Um, you could look at a, that technology area has a lot of potential for producing biogenic a solid fuels that can predict, uh, replace lignite coal that have a similar calorific content and, and quality, but they're completely biogenic. And then CO2 mineralization <clears throat> as an area where um, you use CO2 as a value-added input into the production of building materials. That's another area that's um, very interesting. And I think I, I may have some additional slides, but I think I'm I'm pretty much at time here. And I, I know it took a little bit longer to go through the presentation, so I want to leave a little time in case there were questions. And and I don't think we need to go further than that. Uh, this is just a little more about the the challenges of electrification, et cetera. And then yes, thank you. So thanks for the thanks for the opportunity. Hopefully that didn't take too long. No, that was really fantastic, Eric. Um, thanks so much for setting aside the the time and and bearing with a little bit of technical difficulties. But I think it came across uh, really well. The kind of um, 
broader global perspective on some of those technologies. And I, I think also just a, a helpful framework sort of for sorting through what might um, you know, be most effective and might, might um, really broadly reduce emissions across, you know, you know the industry. So um, I don't think we have any immediate questions, but I, I believe, Eric, you're not going to be available for the later uh, discussion session. No, unfortunately. Uh, but So just want to express my uh, gratitude for your participation here. Um, and just, yeah, thank you for, for that. Um, we are a, a touch behind time, but I'm going to propose that the, the discussion, we take a 10 minute break from the workshop. We'll, it's 1032 on my clock. So, uh, Pacific time will re reconvene at uh, 1042. Welcome back. Um, 10 minute breaks up and just wanted to <clears throat> set the stage for the second half of our CARB SB 596 workshop. Um, have three more speakers to hear from. First, we'll be hearing from Sabby Miller from UC Davis <clears throat> and then from Cody Finke at uh, Brimstone, which is a kind of <clears throat> manufacturer of novel of cement through novel approaches and john o'donnell who is from rondo energy uh provider of industrial heat um, by new technology so <clears throat> some focus on some potential uh new technology developments that might be able to support the long-term goals that we're discussing here today pardon me um, so, I believe we have Sabby Miller here. Um, can I get confirmation that Sabby is available? She's ready. Yes. Can you hear me? Hi, Sabby. Yes, I can yes. hear you. Great. And thank you uh, so much for joining. Um, let me just give a brief introduction of Sabby, and then we can uh, go into the, the presentations for the second half here. Uh, Sabby Miller uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Davis and a faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Her research focuses on lowering the environmental impacts of the built environment, specifically on methods to assess and mitigate the climate, health, and resource burdens from materials demands. Professor Miller serves on several national and international committees pertaining to infrastructure materials sustainability, including the UN Environment Program's Low Carbon Cement Initiative. And she's the recipient of the National Science Foundation's Career Award. So, Dr. Miller, welcome. Um, looking forward to your presentation. All right. Great. Um, sorry for the slight clunkiness, but um, this is it works when we have issues with Zoom. So hopefully this is OK for, for this as well. Um, OK, so uh, I realize that we've already actually had a really fantastic introduction to the utilization of cement um, and a couple of the, the main decarbonization pathways. Um, so I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a high level overview of a couple of those aspects um, just as they pertain to, to the bits that I'm going to go into more detail for. Um, one thing I'd like to do before I dive into those um, different technical topics is kind of remind folks that cement is one of our primary binding materials for the utilization in, in composite systems that we use for many different infrastructure applications. And cement is kind of unique in that, unlike a lot of our infrastructure materials that get used for a bunch of different applications, so for example, steel we use in the built environment, but we also use it in packaging and we also use it in vehicles, cement is really something we use for the built environment. Um, this is a, a slightly old pie chart and we'll have updated data when we uh, finalize our report um, that we're sending over uh, to CARB. But these data are still uh, relatively indicative of where we see cement being utilized. And as you can see, a huge amount goes into our buildings, a large amount goes into streets and highways. Um, this is US average and again, outdated data, but you could see why uh, Tom Teets mentioned we see a huge market driver from Caltrans. It's because 
we put a lot of cement into our streets and highways. So knowing where these materials end up can also really help us understand how we should better engineer them to mitigate carbon dioxide emissions as well as other GHGs. So we've already seen this particular diagram and I'm gonna give a kind of slightly additional context um, to, to beyond what Mihoyo already mentioned, which is, so cement is just one component of concrete. We need it in order to form the hydraulic binder that actually holds together our aggregates, which means that there's a couple of different decarbonization pathways and levers that could get pulled. We heard that Eric mentioned a whole bunch of different ones associated with uh, actually manufacturing the concrete, including things like improved particle packing. But we also know that there can be mitigation efforts that occur at the structural design stage and through prefabrication and all of those other kind of further down the value chain mechanisms. I am not going to be discussing any of those today because SB 596 focuses in really heavily on the cement production. So I'm gonna target uh, what we're mentioning here on that cement production side. Um, but of course there are other levers that I'm happy to, to discuss in, in further detail if anyone is interested at a, at a later time. Okay, so this is a, again, a slightly different permutation of a similar figure that you've seen before, basically emphasizing the fact that, okay, cement is just one constituent in concrete. And in addition to that, really we see that clinker production for our cement is the primary driver in our GHG emissions. It's associated with both chemical derived emissions as well as energy derived emissions. Again, though, just a different schematic emphasizing that same point um, again. Now, we also end up seeing that one of the key drivers in the relatively high fraction of greenhouse gas emissions from this one material is the fact that we need so much of it. This is a global chart, so it's not reflecting California in specific. Uh, rather, it's showing world production um, in terms of kilograms per capita, that's our y-axis, uh, versus the amount of time um, has passed as, as basically our decades uh, on, on our, on our x-axis here. And as you can see, for every person on the planet, we've had a really large upswing in terms of cement production necessary for those, those populations. Um, this is actually being driven primarily by rapid industrialization in a handful of countries. Uh, the most recent spike was actually associated with uh, the buildup of infrastructure in China, which is why you see global greenhouse gas emissions factors that look much higher than what we see in California and even in the United States, it's because we've already built up a fair amount of our infrastructure. And so as we see spikes in different areas associated with buildup of infrastructure, um, those are gonna lead to large global fractions of CO2 emissions, even though in California we're under 2% of the, the CO2 is coming from this material. That said, we still have really high demand for this material. So we need to understand ways to, to decarbonize. Also, to give a little bit of additional perspective, this is a, a chart that's it's just a key example and it's from um, a European key example. So it's not reflective of California, but it's indicative of some of the emissions that we could start to understand. Um, basically, it's showing where we end up seeing emissions from. So if we look at an existing building, we would actually end up seeing that the use phase of that building would be a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions using current grids for, for electricity and heating. Um, we also end up seeing, though, that the construction and maintenance, so basically the embodied carbon dioxide emissions associated with the materials, end up being a significant significant fraction. In our newer construction, we've become much more efficient with our use phase uh, associated with our built environment. And we actually end up seeing that the embodied emissions associated with producing the materials, such as cement, end up being larger contributors. If we examine just one building, uh, we could end up seeing that concrete is only a fraction of the materials that get utilized. And then of course, within concrete, we end up seeing that cement is just one contributor because of course cement is only one constituent. And then if we look at just the cement itself, we end up seeing that a huge fraction of the emissions are associated with that limestone decarbonation, that, that calcination phase that people have been talking about for the production of clinker. So understanding how cement actually works in this full system is kind of necessary for us to understand um, strong decarbonization pathways. So again, keeping in mind that this is just one constituent, we could start to pay attention to California more specifically and see where are we producing our cement and where are we producing the other constituents and how does that relate to where our populations actually need cement-based materials. Now, these are slightly outdated figures. Um, they're based on data from 2015. So if you were looking at them and thinking to yourself, wait a minute, they just said that the Cupertino plant has closed. You're right, it's not 
current data, um, but we also have a, a sense of kind of where our cement plants and cement terminals are based on this, uh, this particular figure. Um, on this chart over here, we could see where our populations are predominantly um, uh, lumped together in the state. And this is, a again, a slightly outdated figure in terms of where our aggregate is getting produced, noting that, if I go back one slide, yes, cement was one of our primary constituents since the one that SB 596 was focused on, but we also end up having a huge volume of our concrete tied to our aggregates. So understanding how that relates to where our populations are, where they need their infrastructure, where cement plants are, and where other constituents are for our concrete starts to, again, paint a more um, robust picture of how we start to decarbonize the system. So we've actually been helping out with a, a little bit of, of preliminary research with, um, with CARB, uh, but we've been working in the cement decarbonization world for quite a while. Um, the methodology that we've started to approach um, basically with this particular project with is trying to understand key technical benefits as well as limitations associated with the greenhouse gas emissions mitigation methods that Mohoyo already mentioned. Um, they're kind of focused on seven key categories of mitigation methods. These include things like fuel switching for cement kilns, um, as well as trying to understand how shifts in electricity generation could heart start to benefit uh, basically greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Uh, this includes also carbon capture and storage methods, um, increased use of supplementary cementitious materials, both at the concrete stage as well as in the cement stage. And I realized that, again, SB 596 is really focused in on that cement uh, production, but noting that the utilization of supplementary cementitious materials can contribute to the hydration products, even if they're blended in at the concrete stage, made us realize, okay, we should probably pay attention to, to how that's getting utilized um, in order to understand the full decarbonization picture. The use of alternative clinkers, um, as well as use of alkali activated materials and energy efficiency, as well as waste heat recovery at the cement plants. So basically we're going in for these seven kind of lumped categories and trying to understand what are the benefits, what are the barriers to implementation for these technology groups, and how can we start to assess whether or not we're going to get the greenhouse gas uh, emissions mitigation that we would like from them. We're also looking at a handful of policy mechanisms that could help drive uh, the implementation of those particular mechanisms. And so here I'm showing you, this is preliminary work. It's not tied to California production, so there's a little caveat here. Um, basically, uh, some of our initial studies in this area have focused in on how can we actually start to see a magnitude of emissions reduction. And as you can imagine, since a handful of folks have already said electricity is contributing about 5% to the greenhouse gas emissions, well, if we change our electricity source, we can reduce about 5% of our greenhouse gas emissions. In terms of changing kiln fuel source, we end up seeing that there's a handful of additional barriers. Um, these can be tied to things like permitting of certain types of fuel resources or trying to put in extra infrastructure, such as pipelines, um, to actually get resources to the kilns. So depending on the fuel resource that gets utilized, there's a handful of different um, ranges in terms of emissions reduction that we would end up seeing there. The utilization of supplementary cementitious materials, depending on replacement levels that are used, can again have a little bit of a variability. The use of alternative clinkers has a really wide range in terms of the emissions reduction, and that's strongly tied to which alternative clinker are you using. And then, of course, the same thing goes with the alkali activated materials. There's a pretty wide range that we could end up seeing in terms of emissions reduction. Notably, when we model carbon capture and storage, oftentimes this is tied to emissions right from um, the cement kilns, which makes sense. That's where you have your concentrated CO2 emissions coming from. But of course, it doesn't capture CO2 from the remainder of the supply chain. And typically, we end up seeing that there's a bit of an inefficiency associated with carbon capture and storage, um, which means, you know, basically we're not going to capture 100% of the CO2 emissions. This inefficiency, as well as the missing supply chain uh, CO2 emissions, means that we are anticipating CCS to not be 100% efficient on, on the full um, spectrum. And in fact, our initial models, again, not specifically for California, just from our preliminary data, are suggesting that we'd probably cap out at about 75% of the emissions could be recaptured at that particular stage. Now, this again, that was kind of a high level summary of some of our initial findings in terms of percent uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, 
we're going to be going into much more detail as we work through this particular process. And of course, I'm happy to answer specific questions on any of those um, that folks might be interested in. In terms of the work that we're doing with the with CARB, um, basically what we're looking at are these seven key areas. And we've started off in terms of doing scoping of which areas we're actually working on. Uh, we're conducting research at the moment, going into more detail in California-specific um, ways on those seven key technologies, as well as preparing a report. Uh, we have already started drafting that particular report, and uh, we're currently working on key sections associated with the barriers for the, each of these technologies, emissions reduction that we would anticipate for these technologies, how they actually play a role in California-specific markets, um, and assessing different types of research development and demonstration that could benefit from uh, different measures. Now, when we look at intervention points associated with these methods, we end up seeing that they actually don't always get applied at the same stage. So again, focusing in on how the seven technologies can be implemented at stages that are within the scope of SB 596 is a key area of one of the technology barriers that we're examining. We're also trying to understand time horizon associated with the implementation of each of these measures. And we're also trying to understand other technical um, restrictions that could uh, be basically a, a potential issue. These include things like, do we actually have the resources to make these materials? So for example, some of the alternative clinkers rely on um, mineral resources that we might not have readily available, um, or they might not be as beneficial from a carbon dioxide perspective if we have to synthetically make those minerals. We also have to keep in mind that we're using this material for infrastructure systems, and we would like those infrastructure systems to continue working. So this is a cartoon of somebody basically handing um, a scientist a report saying, we've made your environmental report greener and now uses 50% less paper. It's a cartoon by Peter Hess. Um, and I think it really captures well that we want to mitigate environmental damage, but we don't want to compromise the material in doing so. So we are also trying to understand, you know, from the perspective of how we need these materials to perform, which degree of replacement or which degree of technology can be implemented while still making sure that the market has the material that they need. Um, in that vein, we're looking at a handful of policy levers that could really help support these decarbonization efforts. Um, I have a handful of those levers listed here, and of course the slides have already been shared, um, but they include things like trying to understand how public procurement could help drive some of the change, how education and training programs can be beneficial, um, as well as improved communication of these different decarbonization methods, um, and trying to understand how each of these methods can be implemented from the perspective of are there geographic clusters that would benefit CCS, for example? Um, would we actually anticipate certain pilot plants being uh, beneficial in certain areas? Et I'm not going to go through the full list because I fear I'm probably close on time. Um, so instead, I'm happy to answer questions associated with any of them. Um, but of course, the full list is posted uh, with the slide deck. And um, just in case you need to reach out, here is. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> uh, I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit, but thank you so much, Savvy, for uh, the, the overview of the work you're doing. Um, I'm gonna, you know, try to keep us on schedule, but I do see one question just popping in uh, from Ankita Gangotra, Gangotra, uh, that maybe <clears throat> you can field, and I believe you'll be available after the, you know, for the remainder. So um, if there are other questions that come in, they'll be opportunity later for responses. So Ankita asks, is the potential of adding SCMs to concrete the same as adding them to cement given different processes are involved? Not sure if you have thoughts on that. <clears throat> Had to figure out how to unmute myself before I could. Um, so in reality, you're right. There's there are different processes involved, and we actually end up seeing that there's different barriers associated with the utilization of those materials at different stages. So um, whether or not there's a market for that type of blended cement, for example. So if we are blending in at that earlier stage, of course Tom is going to be able to speak to that much better than I can. And then of course concrete producers have a little bit of barriers in terms of whether or not they have the ability to have additional silos for for those additional SCMs. Um, in terms of their contributions to net greenhouse gas emissions reduction, um, there's 
with a teeny bit of variability associated with slight shifts in terms of electricity demand for the grinding action um, at the cement plant versus the batching energy necessary for the concrete plant. But the difference is actually so minor that it's kind of within the margin of error due to data uncertainty in general. So um, from the CO2 emissions reduction perspective, they're, they're really, really close. Uh, close enough that I'd feel confident going, we're good with both. Um, yeah, hopefully that, that answers the question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And again, Savvy will be available uh, after the other, the next two speakers are done, we'll have question and answer uh, session. Um, so more opportunities for discussion uh, in a half hour or less or more. <laughs> uh, can I get confirmation about Cody's availability? Um, is Cody Finke? joined yes i am here wonderful um thank you so much for joining cody we're uh dealing with a, some small technical difficulties but it's it's going forward well so um cody i'm going to just briefly introduce you and uh turn the floor over uh cody finke's joining us he is the ceo and co-founder of brimstone which is a Series A company working on a new process to produce Portland cement without CO2 emissions. He has a doctor degree, doctoral degree in electrochemistry from Caltech, and um, he's gonna give an overview of uh, the technology that he's been working on recently. So uh, Cody, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, so I just clicked on share my screen, is that, is that working? Can you see this PowerPoint or this PowerPoint? I can, yes. You can, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, I didn't have to Success. log out. <laughs> okay, can you also see me if I show you props like this? Can you see them? We can see you as well, thanks. Oh, I love that, okay. Um, great, well, yeah, thanks very much for um, inviting me to be here. Um, Really, really appreciate it, and I'm really enthusiastic about what um, SP 596 could mean for the cement industry. Uh, today, I just want to share about what we're working on, um, and I'll start with um, quick personal background. Uh, so, like uh, like Mark mentioned, um, I'm originally a chemist. Uh, I got a PhD in environmental science and engineering down in Southern California at Caltech, and now I live up in Northern California. And I love, it turns out that I love all parts of California. Oh, great. <laughs> and uh, uh, Brimstone is a Series A company. We, we recently raised $55 million from uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is sort of uh, Bill Gates's climate fund, as well as Amazon and, 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 other, and other groups to build the first plant that will make Portland cement via this alternative process, which is by design carbon negative, and I'll tell, talk to you about that um, throughout the presentation. Um, that that first plant will be a pilot facility. It will make you know a few tons per day, uh, and um, likely will be online uh, early early next year, uh, or sorry, excuse me, late next year or early 2024. Uh, so it would be it would definitely be ready to you know. And it would make enough to you know build a, a real size building or uh, a, a sub substantial fraction of, of road or bridge, which would be we would be excited about um, uh, doing in the state of California. So um, stop there. Let's talk about what we believe what we do. So the mission of our company is to develop the next process to make ordinary Portland cement. That is a conventional conventional cement, you know, cement that's the same as the exact same cement that we make every way, uh, or that we make today. Um, but this process uh, would replace the existing process um, and it would also be carbon negative. So it would solve the CO2 problem. Um, we believe that three things need to be true for that to happen. The first is that you need to make the exact same product because we do not want to do battle with um, with regulators, that seems like a an uphill battle uh, that that is that is risky and also time intensive, and we don't have much time. Uh, 
The second is that it has to be lower cost, right? If we want existing cement companies to adopt our process, then it has to have a financial incentive. Um, and same with uh, fi uh, financial institutions. If we want um, to be able to get financing, there has to be a financial incentive of our process over the existing process. And then the third thing that we believe needs to be true is it's got to be zero carbon um, under the least cost operation scenario. So whatever the lowest cost for of energy happens to be in that region, it has to be able to operate using that type of energy and also still be zero carbon. Um, and that's just because that's the point of what we're doing. Right. So um, now let's talk about a little bit about how we do that. Um, I think for this audience, you know, say, I think Savy will cover this, so I don't actually have to cover this background, which is great. Um, but I will spend some time uh, showing how, whoops, showing how cement is made today um, so that you can compare it to how we would make cement. All right, so um, this slide is a cartoon showing how cement's made today. As we've talked about, um, cement is a calcium-based material, or ordinary Portland cement is a calcium-based material. Um, it is uh, today produced from a rock called limestone, and um, in order to access that calcium um, in the limestone, you have to first remove the CO2 that is in the rock. So you heat up that CO2 in a or that calcium carbonate or limestone in a kiln with a fuel, and this chemical reaction in red happens, and um, CO2 is released from the limestone, leaving behind calcium oxide. And that calcium oxide is what can go and produce cement. And these CO2 emissions, of course, are why we say cement is difficult to decarbonize, um, because the majority of this, the emissions of CO2 you know, are all these process emissions that have nothing to do with the fuel. Okay, and then once the Portland cement is made, it's then mixed either at the cement plant or at the concrete plant with supplementary cementitious materials. Um, these supplementary cementitious materials have proven to be somewhat of a problem for the cement industry these days um, because they're currently sourced primarily from waste products from burning coal and other industries. So the, the two uh, by far largest supplementary cementitious materials are fly ash, which is the waste product from coal fire power plants, and blast furnace slag or basic oxygen furnace slag, which is the waste product from burning coal and primary steel production. And as we all well know, um, both in the United States and around the world, uh, the production of electricity via coal is no longer the cheapest way to make electricity. It is much cheaper to make electricity from natural gas or renewables, which is probably all of our favorites in this room. Um, and therefore, you know, financial institutions have been preferentially financing those product projects and, and coal has therefore been declining and with it, fly ash has been declining. And then the same is true with steel production. So if you can recycle steel, it is much cheaper than making new steel. So we see electric arc furnaces, which barely make any slag um, all over the place. Um, and these electric arc furnaces um, are the re basically the reason why you know, steel continues to be low cost. <laughs> And also the reason uh, why we don't get much that that much slag um, anymore. So both of these products are scarce, and they're you know these days they're really necessary additives um, for for cement. Um, and there's but the scarcity has driven up the cost, and it's also driven up the headache for cement companies. So in summary, we kind of see the cement industry having two big problems. The first is the CO2 problem, right, where the Energy solutions that work in every other industry don't work in the cement industry because most of the emissions come from the rock. Um, and then the second is the supplementary cementitious materials problem, where a necessary component of the cement that the cement industry uses to make cement, um, they cannot get it because or or it's expensive to get because it's scarce. And that's just because of dynamics with the broader energy transition. So at Brimstone, we realized both of these two things. And uh, we went out to uh, develop a process that can make the exact same, um, you know, the exact same material that is conventionally produced. So uh, our, our, you know, we saw cement as a calcium-based rock. We looked for, okay, where is calcium in the world? And it turns out that calcium is also in a rock like this, okay, which is a basalt. This is a cal or a calcium silicate rock is how what we call these things generally. So 
to be really clear, this is not wollastonite, right? That's a very rare rock. This is a general calcium silicate rock, like a basalt. Um, and it's actually much more common in limestone and it contains calcium, but it does not contain CO2. So we developed a process to extract the calcium from this rock. We can therefore make the exact same Portland cement that is conventionally produced. And here's actually a mortar cube that we made with our Portland cement that we produced in house. This is a, a industry standard mortar cube uh, used for testing compressive strength or the F'C uh, of, of, of mortar or, um, that's associated with the cement. And um, this is, and, and that was, you know, quite amazing because basically we, by using this rock, we can fully eliminate the process emissions. So there's very difficult to decarbonize emissions. We can just fully eliminate them. Um, the other exciting thing about this rock is it turns out that what was left behind when we leached out the calcium to make the Portland cement was supplementary cementitious materials. And not just any supplementary cementitious material, it's a supplementary cementitious material that is identical to what's conventionally used and passes the ASTM standard for C618. So again, uh, you can use the exact same products that's conventionally produced. You don't have to deal with new regulation and, and, and trying to convince people that it's okay to build a giant building out of a material that a building has never been built out of. It's just the same material. Um, and because these two materials, the supplementary cementitious material and the Portland cement can be co-generated from our, from one rock in one location, we actually are pretty confident that this process will be lower cost at scale, as long as we, you know, our scale up our engineering appropriately, which means that um, we could not only have cost savings, but we could also eliminate all that CO2. And then the final thing that is really exciting about this process for us is, is the, the only waste product that we actually make from this rock um, is a magnesium compound, and typically magnesium hydroxide. And magnesium hydroxide just sitting in air will react with CO2 in the air to form magnesium carbonate. Um, and that, that is permanently sequestered or mineralized CO2, which means that this, um, that this rock can make Portland cement and SCM and therefore make a lower cost solution and solve the SCM scarcity problem and, and just not make the CO2. You don't have to deal with difficult, with expensive CCS. And it also can make a product which sequesters CO2, meaning that regardless of what the cheapest fuel is, if it's clean electricity or clean hydrogen or you know garbage and tires and coal like the conventional cement industry uses right now, it still is a carbon negative process. Um, so again, you don't have to go and overhaul the economic system or anything like that. So in summary, right, we, we make the same products, Portland cement and C618 SCM. We make, we make it at what we believe to be, will at scale be a lower cost. We make it with no emissions because there's no CO2 in the rock. And we make a, by, uh, a byproduct that passively sequesters CO2. So it just sits in air and reacts with CO2 in the air. Uh, so here's a graph that shows that, um, and we have a and we have a third party LCA that we're happy to share um, uh, if people contact me after. Um, but this shows you know kilograms of CO2 per ton of cement on the y-axis, and then here's um, process, and, and then here's the conventional process on the left, and our process on the right. So the conventional process. Basically, the emissions associated with producing cement are just around 750 kilograms of CO2 per ton. Um, and that's with, you know, fuel is a global average fuel. So a mixture of coal and, and tires and, 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 and biomass and everything else, plus the process emissions, right? So the CO2 that comes from the, the rock. And then our process, still with a global average fuel mix, is carbon negative. It's, you know, less than 100 kilograms of CO2 per ton. Um, and that's because of that, um, both no CO2 in the rock and the magnesium component. So it's, it really can turn this cement, you know, it, it would right now building buildings is a big climate problem and it could turn a building buildings into part of the climate solution, which we're very excited about. Um, so everyone always asks us where these rocks are and specifically if they're in the state of California. So, um, this is a map of just publicly available data. Okay, so this is calcium silicate rocks. Um, 
And these are calcium silicate rocks that have high enough calcium concentration that they would be economical in our process. And these are the ones that are just that are just known. And you can see you can't even see the state of California because it's just covered in these rocks, right? All of Northern California is basically covered in basalt. All of Southern California is basically covered in gabbro. Right? <laughs> this is a um, an incredibly common rock, um, and uh, it is. It, in fact, it makes up 50% or so of the Earth's crust, which is more than um, more than limestone substantially. And we can, uh, <laughs> uh, and we actually know of many more deposits than are even pictured here because we've actually gone out and looked for them. And there's there's a lot of very high quality deposits out there. Um, so here's some pictures of where we are today, so you can sort of see into our laboratory, um, which is currently in Oakland, California. And you can and you can see where um, the the land that we just purchased to build our pilot site, um, where we'll be producing producing our first um, our first Portland cement, uh, or, or excuse me, we'll be producing our first um, Portland cement in a continuous process at scale, right? So so you know tons per day, enough to build a a, a large size building or a, a significant stretch of freeway with a year's production, um, and that'll be ready at you know early 2024 or late 2023 um so you know in summary we eliminate emissions from cement production um by not having co2 in the rock and, and having and producing that magnesium we vertically integrate the production of scm and portland cement so we can instead of having that complicated international shipping chain you can produce both products on site at the same location which leads to cost parity or better and then the ability to sequester up to one ton of CO2 per ton of cement. So some of the things that we're really excited about with CARB is the opportunity to you know, help us scale, right? So, so, so right now it's, it's difficult um, in California and other places for lots of reasons. So in order to, so, so we need financing to build a first commercial plant, which would be hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we need permitting at a at a scale that's appropriate uh, or, or a speed that's appropriate. And there's lots of places that you know, the, according to the laws, the permits work in California because our rock is so common. We actually, you know, we, there are plenty of places outside of Knox non attainment zones, but we we just need um, speed so that we can build these this thing on time. Um, and then. Uh, and, and and that would allow us to you know produce this carbon negative material faster. So some things that would be helpful would be procurement, right? So if we got some sort of we don't need advanced money, but if we got advanced commitment from, for example, as Sabi mentioned, the Department of Transportation in California or Caltrans, because uh, they consume the plurality of of cement. Um, like if we got some advanced commitments, we could take that to a bank and get the financing we need. Alternatively, we, you know, if financing was available that was you know tolerant of a first of a kind plant. You know that would you know skip the middle person, and we wouldn't need that procurement, um, advanced procurement, if that's too hard, um, or anything that helps per make permitting faster. So some laws that are already on the books in other sectors, you know, would be like a a, um, a low uh, a low carbon cement standard, like there's a low carbon fuel standard, right? So that type of policy would be incredibly helpful. Um, or clean clean cement purchase agreements. You know, there's clean power purchase agreements that you know have, offer advanced commitments for for purchasing power. If the same thing could be done in cement, like that could be really fantastic for us. And I'm sure there's many others that that y'all can think of a lot clearer because you know the space a lot better. But I'd be super excited to engage on any of these. Um, and finally, um, you know, if you have any questions, please reach out, and you know, I've, I'll be sticking around for the Q and A period also. So thanks very much for your time, and looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Cody. Thanks for the overview of the process um, and and for the clothing, closing thoughts. Um, there is one question that, that's popping up I can read for you. It's uh, from Stephen Bryan. He's asking, uh, does the brimstone process produce the same reactive man-made minerals, C3S, A-lite, and C2S, Bay-lite, found in Portland cement? Clinker. If so, yeah, uh, the technology, but not sure if that's. Or... Absolutely, it's not, no problem. So, we do that in the kiln just like it's conventionally done. Um, so, so basically, we extract the calcium oxide from this, from this uh, rock here, and then we put that into a kiln. So, the last of our process is identical. So, in the conventional process, they extract calcium oxide from limestone, we extract calcium oxide from this rock, and then we end up putting the exact same thing in our kiln as is conventionally put into a kiln. So, 
we make we can make cements with you know 70 plus percent c3s um and we have uh and we can make uh, we can make you know types one through typical types one through five cement so a light bail c3s c4 uh, c2s c3s c4af c3a we make everything um it is identical in every way there's just no difference because the same things are going into the same kiln and yeah you know, i guess one more point there is like this is i should mention this is not the first time that um, an industrial process or, or or the portland cement has been made from a new raw material right there's the mueller hewn process which was done in europe in the 60s which made portland cement from gypsum so it's just a you know it's, it's, it's just another way to make the exact same Great, and then um, with that, I think we'll move to the final speaker who we have lined up. Um, so thank you so much, Cody, for the input there. Thanks for your time. It sounds like you will be available for uh, after this final presentation for some further discussion. So thanks yes. for being available for that. And um, I see John popping up on the screen, which is great. Um, let me briefly introduce John O'Donnell. Um, John's the CEO of Rondo Energy. He has over 30 years of experience taking novel solutions from conception to reality across the energy, semiconductor, and supercomputer industries. Prior to founding Rondo, John was co-founder and vice president of development for Glass Point Solar, which has delivered solar industrial heat worldwide. He's a published author, of numerous, published author of numerous technical papers and holds more than 20 patents in the US and internationally. John earned a Bachelor of Science degree with special distinction in computer science from Yale University. Uh, welcome, John. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thanks, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I am so glad I get to speak after the folks who've talked about all of the other technologies. What we're doing is cross-cutting, I think, across all of those things and synergistic. Um, Rondo is, uh, can, you, can you see my screen properly? Is that working? We are seeing your slides now, yes. All right, great. Um, uh, Rondo is a California company based in Alameda, California. We are also, uh, Breakthrough Energy uh, backed, Bill Gates backed company. We're backed by Breakthrough Energy and by Energy Impact Partners who are uh, backed by the electric power industry. And we have two international cement manufacturers as investors today. We have actually three different projects internationally in the cement industry right now. Uh, one in Asia and two in Europe. One of those is uh, building a pilot for a, an SCM production plant that is making calcined clay with intermittent electric power. The others are more broad that are focused on step-by-step -step, uh, process transformation. Uh, I spoke yesterday at the Breakthrough Summit and I'm gonna use some of what I talked about then and what we talk about now. Um, as I said, what we're doing is, is cross-cutting because we're focused on replacing essentially all industrial heat with intermittent electric power. California uses more natural gas for industrial heat across all the sectors uh, than it does for electric power today. And the vast majority of the gas and the, all, essentially all the coal that we use uh, are imported. Um, California's policies create this challenge. How are we going to replace that energy without deindustrializing? We don't, you know, there've been a lot of conversations, including here, about how are we going to use carbon border adjustment mechanisms or whatever. But, you know, the great news is that we're now in an era where intermittent renewable electricity is available at a scale and at a cost that is for sure lower cost than any other decarbonization decarbonized heat and is uh you were at the moment where 
the tools to harness that intermittent electricity and put it to use for industrial purposes are emerging. We are, the, the CEO of one of the, the solar developers recently said that the topic I'm about to talk about, that is using intermittent electricity for industrial heat is an inevitable trillion dollar business. We agree, we, we're pretty sure we're one of the leaders. Um, and what this means is that in-state renewables can become the foundation of in-state industry. And given California's remarkable wind resources, the largest wind project in the country, solar resources, the lowest cost solar energy in the country, you know, California has superpowers that could be put to use to solve this for scale. During that heat wave the other day, we I think we had a 52 gigawatt system peak. We have on the order of 28 gigawatts of PV in the electricity system today. This is everybody who's in cap and trade emitting 25,000 tons a year or more. It's gonna be 100 gigawatts of new generation over time needed to just replace that fuel combustion. And individual cement plants are gonna need between 1,000 and 2,400 megawatts locally. So, you know, 2.4 gigawatts at a single facility. And it turns out that's practical and it's economical and it applies across basically all the processes and all the materials that we just talked about because they all have one thing in common they have pyro processing in common and a substantial energy demand and again there's a new kind of fuel that's available but you can only have it some of the time and so if there is a technology that can convert that intermittent energy to continuous supply at the suitable safety, density, efficiency, temperature, cost, scalability. We have the foundation for solving a big portion of uh, cement and putting all those new processes and carbon capture on a zero carbon energy infrastructure. This particular matter is something I've been working on for a long time. I built my first energy storage test line at Sandia back in 2008 built more than all half of all the solar industrial heat that's running worldwide in previous companies. And we put Rondo to, together two and a half years ago, recognizing that we're just entering this era that the concentrating solar technologies day is kind of over because electricity has gotten cheaper. So how do we store electricity cheaply at high temperature? After a lot of work, we found out actually there's 300 gigawatts of high temperature heat storage running in the world right now. That technology could be adapted for this purpose. Every blast furnace has about 350 or 400 megawatts of heat storage in brick that is doing waste heat recapture from the exhaust heat of blast furnaces and using that heat to preheat the inlet air. This is a coal saving technology that was first patented in 1828. We found a way to use that material in that temperature range, but heat it with electric power. So as to build these things that we call heat batteries that take intermittent electricity, they heat thousands of tons of that same brick material to between 1100 and 1500 C using the dumbest thing possible, the same electrical resistance heaters that are in your toaster, your hairdryer, ceramic stoves, uh, and industri you know, every industrial heating system. Depending on the temperature, they're metallic or ceramic heaters. And our, our core breakthrough was understanding how to rapidly heat and then continuously discharge so that we could discharge heat as flowing superheated air, flowing superheated CO2 or superheated steam, either through a completely conventional steam generator or directly to a process. Inside one of our units, a little tester, it looks like this. That is, there are electrical heaters that are heating brick and the core, the core of the patented breakthroughs is a thing that's called a radiation echo chamber. We, build a structure and the, the critical matter is it uniformly heats the brick 
via heat radiation and re-radiation to within just a few degrees of the heater temperatures themselves without heat transfer fluids and without you know uh, turbo pumps the way the sun heats the earth with thermal radiation and now we've heated thousands of tons of brick to high temperature we pull heat out of it exactly the way that the steel mill guys figured out 200 years ago that is by arranging gas passages within the array so that as air or co2 flows through it it's it comes into temperature balance with what it's flowing through so that you can get deep temperature swings in the average temperature of the material which is how we store energy while getting continuous constant temperature at the output so intermittent electricity to continuous heat that's the foundation and at industrial scale um, you know the each unit that we're uh, uh, building we're building a standard module right now that matches a furnace or a boiler that burns 85 million BTUs an hour of natural gas there are hundreds of those boilers of that size in California and yeah individual furnaces I mean individual cement plants you know some of them burn 1500 million BTUs an hour you know they're, they're large loads so um, there's going to be a step-by-step -step journey to delivering the concentrated high temperature heat driving processes and this is a subject that we're deeply engaged in you know the there's been lots of discussion of the various emissions roles as i mentioned earlier we're engaged in one project today where we're powering calcination of a zero emission scm uh, about 60 percent of the heat or the fuel is at the calcination stage where most of the co2 is released 40 percent is in the clinkering stage and they're at different temperatures right one of those reactions needs 900 and the other needs much higher temperature so what we're talking about here can immediately power the first of those steps and we talk about the whole picture right because if we want to if we're just focusing on eliminating the emissions from the heat for today's processes or tomorrow's what are our options like one of them is let's do fuel switching um the short statement about biofuels you know before the war natural gas was trading at four dollars a million btu and renewable natural gas was trading at 20. have at it by the way there's very very little of it um similarly you know there are at least 10 different companies saying we're going to take all the woody biomass in the state of california and do x or y or z with it it's not a pathway to get anywhere close to our long-term goals and it's also you know again one a pathway that results in a significant increase in cost versus business as usual another pathway this is one that's being explored fairly extensively in europe in particular is let's just switch from fuel fired kilns to various kinds of electric kilns the project that we're engaged in funded by the denmark government is exactly at this matter are we going to use continuous electricity as the source for our new generation furnaces well some places in europe you can have that at about 60 percent of the hours of the year 60 percent capacity factor because of a blend of wind and solar more or less everywhere in the world you have a, everywhere in the world though you have a problem that in california only 30 percent 20 percent of the hours is the dominant electricity in the electricity grid solar the rest of the time best case it's 50 percent efficiency burning natural gas so one unit of heat going into an electric kiln is using twice as much fuel as if that electric if that kiln had just been powered by natural gas for 60 percent or 70 percent of its energy the other matter that's a bigger matter is because you need to power it continuously you need to connect it to the grid and its energy there's now this problem They've, you want to build a new solar project connected to the california grid as of right now the average interconnection time for getting new projects on the grid is seven and a half years so 
little problem with how fast we can go down this path. A couple of problems. Um, obviously, one of the main pathways is using electrolyzers. As they come down in cost, they don't necessarily need a grid connection. So there's an unlimited energy supply. The, one of the challenges, though, is that between electrolysis and compression and combustion, it's about two units of electricity in for one unit of heat out. Everything else is great. You know, yes, you have to make some kiln changes because of there's no carbon in the flame, and so the radiation balance is different. But you have a you have something where okay, it's not 5x where you were. That's good. It's not 4x, and the Inflation Reduction Act just has actually created some subsidies for hydrogen that are gonna bring it down into the range of business as usual. Um, and then the, the, what we're doing and what others are doing, that is this electric thermal energy storage. And the biggest number I wanna draw your attention to is the fact that because there's no electrochemistry anywhere, from electricity in to high temperature heat out, it's about 98%, it's 1.05 units of electricity for one unit of heat. And uh, again, before the IRA, somewhat more expensive. We're in a, the right now in 2022, not 2027 or 2030, we're right now at a point where we're roughly at cost parity and for sure going through a transition where it'll be cheaper than conventional heat. So there are two technologies here that are the only ones that can really meaningfully go to scale. And one of them can go to scale much faster because for sure the, lim the rate limiting step in how fast we transition to electrified heat is how fast can we build the wind and solar projects? That's a global thing. Last year in Sweden, only 22% of the wind projects that were proposed were permitted. You know, people may feel differently right now about those decisions, but look, that's a problem here. It's a land resource problem. You know, the 2X the land, you know, it, it's, I mentioned it's 100 gigawatts to replace all the fuel combustion, uh, but if you're using hydrogen, it's actually 200 gigawatts. So there, you know, this class of electric thermal storage is not an answer for everything but it's a very important new tool in the toolbox for immediately driving the first 40% or 60% of the heat. It's also an interesting tool as this transition happens. These plants, the heat balance of these plants is gonna change. Mihoyo showed a process where like clinker kiln waste heat is part of the input heat to calcination makes all kinds of sense. There are a number of interesting studies going on in academia and in the guys who build plants, looking at other things to do. And one of the things that's unique about integrating thermal electric power generation alongside this is it provides base load electricity to drive the plants, reusing captured waste heat that's then lifted to a higher temperature for higher efficiency. So while you know a plant might have a 50 megawatt load for electricity and a thousand megawatt load for heat, decarbonizing that 50 megawatt load is also high value. Um, these technologies, when I say they're cross-cutting, they're also of course cross-cutting in that this is a pathway for very high efficiency, 95% combined efficiency, driving any of the, uh, low temperature or the high temperature uh, 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 flue gas and direct air capture technologies because as has been abundantly mentioned, they're gonna urgently also be need to be driven forward and their energy demands are enormous. Um, and again, this is a pathway for providing those at scale it's kind of off topic here, but we've done a, quite a bit of work with others in their carbon management portfolio approach and found that direct heat down this track is actually significantly lower capex and lower and much higher profitability than carbon capture for the portion of the carbon pop, the thing that it, that it 
delivers. The other thing about this class of what Rondo is doing is the deployment of units like this, where now I have an enormous energy demand, but I don't need it continuously. I can take all the megawatt hours I'm gonna need today in four hours, and I'm gonna be able to choose, or the grid operator is gonna be able to choose when I take them. Here's the day last year in Southern California. This is all of SP15, Southern California. Um, this is uh, what all the solar projects in SP15 could have delivered. There was 12 gigawatts available. Here's what they did deliver. I think we took an average of 10. So there was, first of all, a ton of solar energy that was available for generation that wasn't taken. Now, of course, as we go forward, a lot of folks are working on using lithium ion batteries to capture some of that energy and move it to the evening. Um, here's what happened in, in uh, uh, whole, uh, electricity prices. If you'd been able to participate in the wholesale market, um, you know, you would have paid an average of $27 that for a megawatt hour that day against if you're in cap and trade last year before the war, you were paying like $15 a megawatt hour between fuel and carbon. So that's not attractive. But if you bought all your power in a few hours that day, your power would have been a dollar or two a megawatt hour on an, and on an annual basis in a ton of nodes near where those cement plants are that number would have been about $15 a megawatt hour. As I said, right now the conditions exist so that lower that, that intermittent electricity can be lower cost, not only lower cost than the other low carbon pathways, but lower cost than business as usual today. It's a big step though, from where we're sitting having this conversation right now to this stuff running, right? My job, number one, is bringing our our first units to scale, getting us to scale. I will tell you, we're gonna. You'll see announcements this year of our first unit and early next year in our second unit. I will tell you that we are manufacturing in Asia and in California today. Um, so we're in construction and in manufacturing. This is coming in a bunch of places in a bunch of sectors. But when we look at, you know, how do we make it happen? Here, you know, I have to admit, I may be the person on the call who knows the least about the whole scope of SB 596. What I've learned so far is that it could be fundamentally transformative. Um, and there are a couple of really big issues if we want to actually see change rather than just talk about it. Number one, we need huge flows of private capital. Those flows of private capital, you know, typically don't occur very often. You build a kiln and you run it for 40 years or more. And in order to make investments decisions about new facilities, there needs to be very clear long-term certainty about energy supply, mineral supply, market demand, uh, the regulatory framework. That takes some time right now. We're not at a time today. We're just entering a time when Cap and trade, for example, has become investable. Canada's low carbon market is wildly more investable than California's because it's a tax with a fixed slope. You can make long-term uh, decisions about investments. What's happening in the scoping plan process, and here, this is one of the most urgent things for new technologies like mine and others to reach scale Billions of dollars have to flow, and they will not happen until there is clarity and certainty. And the other is, if you're gonna build a you know, $500 million, billion dollar plant, you must have absolute certainty about the, the things, the foundations it's resting on. So pilots are important. And the, the last thing, I know I'm at, at time, there are urgent regulatory barriers that stand between effective deployment of large-scale hydrogen and effective deployment of any of the electric thermal storage technologies. You know, the glass factory in Fresno is burning natural gas on a, at noon in July in the worst non-attainment area in North America when wholesale electricity prices are zero. They're not allowed to buy power at below $100 a megawatt hour. 
there are some challenges that, you know, there are things that are cross-cutting in the regulatory framework. We're hoping that part of what's going on in this initiative will look at some of those other areas and identify enabling issues, supporting issues, and removing obstacles. Thanks. Are there? Self off mute. Thanks so much, John, for the for the input um, and the descriptions of your technology and some of the the potential benefits there. Um, very interesting, and obviously not only limited to the cement sector, but you know potentially a a huge variety of other applications here. That's right. Um, there is one question that is being directed towards you. I'm not sure it's actually uh, in your wheelhouse, but I'll, I'll pose it uh, since you're up here, and then we'll start moving towards the final Q&A and wrap up. But uh, uh, Jan Greigier, I apologize, uh, or Jan, uh, it seems you need a lot of power midday at the plant. Um, how, how much is electric transmission and distribution capacity a, a problem? So ah, really thanks. speaking to the, the challenge yeah. of the, the, the grid, I, I think. In this problem of transition, transmission and distribution, um, can you let me share my screen for just one moment again? Uh, uh, there we go. So let's, well, what's going on here? Beep, 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 it's, is it gonna let me? Yeah, this has been a challenge, so maybe okay. just maybe just talk uh, through it. If yeah, yeah, sure. So if I, I mentioned it's about 100 gigawatts of new generation that's going to be needed to power everything, and about 40 of those gigawatts can be built within 10 miles of the load. If we look at you know the the northern California, the northernmost California plant, and all the plants at the Grapevine and South, Tehachapi and South, there are excellent wind or solar resources that can be built nearby and both what the hydrogen folks are doing and especially what we are doing rondo heat batteries manage non-grid connected wind farms and non-grid connected solar arrays so that those huge energy flows don't need to go through the grid they're serving one load and it, you know and that's actually a really important matter is it's going to enable this pathway enables that transformation without adding burden to the grid because one of our biggest problems is getting grid expansion permitted and built it's complicated and slow and there is i see the vast majority of the thermal energy needed for cement does not need to be connected to the grid so it can bypass that challenge Great, thanks. Um, you know, so this was the final uh, speaker, John. Thank you so much for sharing again. Um, invite you to stay on video as we transition to, um, you know, it's just some final Q and A, final thoughts. Um, and I'll I'll invite Sabi and Cody. <clears throat> um, and Tom to, to join on video too, um, just to kind of make sure folks can remember who, who presented and see if there are any questions that uh, pop up. You know, I, I think this was, you know, I just wanna characterize again where we are. We're just starting out here. I think this was a really good uh, start to gather information, um, hear from, a lot of different perspectives on what's out there. I, you know, I think I, we heard about the potentially electrifying heat. We heard directly about uh, potentially new manufacturing me methods. We heard about replacement materials and other ways to de decarbonize the heat and carbon capture and sequestration. There's, you know, hard to decarbonize, but there's quite a suite of option of potential options out there. And I think this was really helpful in seeing those. Um, and you know, Eric also kind of weighed in on some some frameworks for assessing these um, from a from a bigger picture perspective too. 
Um, and so, you know, I think where we are is seeing there, there are potential options out there for moving forward. Some are happening already. We've seen with the, some of the Portland limestone cement material manufacturers. Um, the guidepost that's out there, net zero emissions by 2045, that's <laughs> aggressive and it's, you know, it's not that far out. So um, I think, you know, we need to think about the time, time frame for, for California. Um, you know, we, we started to hear some about barriers to, you know, some of the challenges. Uh, several folks flagged uh, kind of areas where support might be needed for implementing technologies, for growing technologies. Um, those are things we're going to need to really understand as we develop, per the bill, Senate Bill 596, a strategy for getting from where we are here uh, to that net zero GHG emissions by 2045. So I think the, you know, the, the bill kind of frames it as looking at the technologies, considering the barriers, and designing strategy to kind of overcome those barriers so that we can get get to where, where we need to, to be. Um, certainly the Air Resources Board will be a part of that. It's gonna involve conversations with a broad array of state agencies. There's likely gonna need to be coordination with, with uh, federal entities, with our local air districts, with our local communities, um, with you know our pu like public health experts. Um, environmental organizations. There's a lot of uh, continued discussion, I think, that needs needs to happen. Um, so we look we look forward to uh, having that having those conversations. Um, just want to remind everyone, uh, we have the web page. We do have an open comment docket. I think it's going to be essentially up through November. Uh, for you um, and anyone who's interested to post written comments in, in response. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess I you know, wanted to follow up and, and see if anyone else uh, who, who gave presentation today has any further thoughts or reactions to uh, some of the other information that was presented maybe subsequently. And then a, a few more questions popped up uh, in the in the chat from audience members. Um, we can step through uh, some of those as well, and um, also invite additional questions. Um, so, you know, for starters, I'll, I'll give panelists an opportunity just to go off mute and um, weigh in if there's any reactions or further thoughts from from what you've seen today. Not everybody at once, but sounds like uh, maybe, maybe I'll I'll turn over to a few of the questions that that came in that we weren't able uh, to get through the first time around. Um, you know, and uh, there's a couple. Actually, apologies. Let me pull up on a different screen. Be easier for me to see over here. Um, Allison, early on in the in the discussion presentations, uh, had a question about how hydrogen could be used to improve efficiency uh, or for heat recovery. Um, maybe I can <laughs> do a first cut response to this. I mean, from my perspective in applications such as the cement sector we're really only we would only be talking about combusting hydrogen to provide heat not necessarily to improve efficiency um like the, the efficient use of energy or um to provide any sort of heat recovery maybe so you know i think the the pathway there you know would likely be um, if we're talking about decarbonizing the fuels that are used for heat, 
um, generating that hydrogen by a low carbon process, whether that's renewable electricity and electrolytic, uh, whether that's a biomass gasification or something else, but then likely combusting that uh, to provide the heat for the kiln for the calcination process. Um, you know, I think that that's gonna, uh, maybe the cement plant operators could weigh in a little bit, but there would need to be uh, some changes at a, at a plant to, you know, that's using one type of fuel to switch over, changes relating to uh, supplying that fuel to the, the source, to the actual burners themselves, um, might need to be swapped out to potential emissions control systems. So, um, you know, I, I, I think if I'm understanding the, the question, it's more related to using hydrogen as a fuel to displace the, the current fuels that are using uh, for heat. But um, if I'm missing the point, feel free to chime in and I'll, I'll invite others to maybe weigh in on, on things I might have missed. No, oh, I think Mark, you said it exactly right. I mean, that's the hydrogen wind, combusting hydrogen does require, and what we've seen from others, uh, some process changes, but they are fairly modest. It's still, an in, you can have internal combustion in the kiln, but, you know, one guy I was talking to said, it's a little bit like heating your house by burning brandy. You know, the, it's a lot of energy input per unit of energy output. So it works, but, and there are, pro, there are things that only it can do, right, but today, that's the way to get the highest temperature heating clinkering with very modest process changes. Um, and using it, using it judiciously as little as possible, um, you know, is a pathway to the, to the lowest cost. But the heat recapture at the back end of the process is an area that lots of folks are working on, but I think that's independent of what fuel we're using at the front end. Sure, there might be uh, you know, other types of heat recovery options um, to use any waste heat that might heat that might be coming off the kiln to um, just um, prevent it from being wasted. Um, David, or also early on in the presentation, um, had a question: Does the bill require a net zero within the cradle to gate boundary? Um, I think that's, you know, a subject that needs to be explored before we can fully say exactly what the boundary conditions are here. Um, it, there's a little bit of ambiguity by my read of, you know, exactly what, uh, you know, might be appropriate. And, you know, there might be a, a broader array of options depending on how the, how the boundary conditions, the scope of the bill is interpreted. Um, so, you know, I think in the staff presentation that Mahoyo gave, she uh, weighed in on a, a couple interpretations. Is it just simply the scope one emissions at, at the plant site? Is it scope two that might include the electricity generation emissions? Might there be um, some type of life cycle uh, approach that um, considers the, the raw materials uh, more fully? Um, I think that's an area where uh, discussions need to need to happen before we make anything make any final path forward. I don't think it's clearly articulated in the bill, um, and I would invite you know folks to weigh in um, when they provide comments uh, to the comment docket there. Um, I'm gonna. There's a couple. Couple questions that are maybe similar. Um, Vedant uh, asks, what are CARB's plans to shoulder some of the high CapEx burden in implementing these novel cement decarbonization strategies? Um, there's other questions. Are other blended cements like Portland slag cement or LC3 being considered? Will ARB be providing economic incentives for the PLC? Um, you know, these are, uh, I would say, we're, we're not in any position to, we, we're, we're in the initial stages here. We're in information gathering. Uh, I don't want to presuppose any specific pathway strategy. Um, there's likely to be looking forward an evolving legislative landscape. 
Um, we're, you know, we're expecting to see evolving technology landscape. Um, so from, from my perspective, I, I kind of categorize these questions as, you know, we're not sure, we're, we're developing this. That's, these are maybe things that are on the menu um, and, you know, inviting comments to hear perspectives on what might be pluses and minuses of, you know, one approach versus another and, you know, how, how complementary approaches might, might fit in. Um, any, any other thoughts beyond what I just said from any of the folks who spoke today? And maybe I, I've sort of lost the ability to see the questions as they're rolling in. So I'm going to invite uh, maybe Blaine or Mohoyo to make sure that we've got uh, the questions that are coming in more recently covered. That's OK. Um, I can read some of oh, Blaine, sorry. The Blaine. Go ahead, Mohio. Okay, uh, this may be this may not be chronological, um, but um, um, sorry, I'm trying to. I actually, uh, Mohoyo, Sorry. I've actually find, <laughs> I've navigated the GoToWebinar and found the the questions panel. So, um, Thank you. and let me see. So, I do have one directed uh, to Dr. Miller, uh, which is simply, "What are some examples of alternative clinker?" Um, so uh, the the term we were kind of using it somewhat broadly to just basically mean not Portland clinker. Um, so uh, the ones that were already mentioned in the the workshop were like the reactive bayolite Portland clinker, the calcium sofa aluminate clinkers, um, the carbonatable calcium silicate clinkers. Basically. It's a different formulation, but it's still a cement that'll hold together aggregates. The issue ends up being, though, that for some of those alternative clinkers, they actually form a cement that doesn't necessarily fit well with our standardized testing methods. And then there's a little bit of question as to how they'd be applied with a code. But of course, that would just be a barrier that we'd be analyzing as as part of this. Um, hopefully, that that answered the questions. Of different mineral phases, or different ratios of mineral phases. And, and I see a, a question is coming in from Andrea saying um, whether asking whether nanocellulose is being considered as a concrete extender. Um, and you know, again, you know, there's a lot of technologies out there. Um, certainly, no potential technologies being excluded from any process. You know, as an option at this point. Um, so I would I would just invite um, information materials on um, exactly what that is. I can't claim I don't claim to know <laughs> exactly, but Savvy, it sounds like I see you nodding your head. Maybe uh, you have thoughts there. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've been working with other folks with the with um, different types of nanocellulose. Um, I'm not sure if we discuss it with internally, but if it's something that we want to look at, we absolutely can look at it. Um, the small level dosing of the nanocellulose to basically kind of reduce the amount of clinker that's necessary is I assume what's being discussed. And it's an interesting area, depending on the pulp source and the processing necessary for the nanocellulose, they can actually be really high impact. But if we use them at low dosages, it can start to balance out. So it could be a pretty interesting area. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about some of the other potential ramifications when we're talking about some of these material replacements and some of the things that we might be confronting when we're talking about um, you know resistance to change within industry within construction industry and things like that and um, you know, so that just strikes me as just potentially one of those barriers that we were talking about that might need to be 
considered uh, as we kind of weigh an option like that. Uh, it looks like there's sort of a a question for for Cody on um, about if Brimstone is currently exploring ways to increase the rate of CO2 removal. From magnesium oxide, so uh, talking about enhanced weathering. Um, curious if, the, if you have thoughts on that point. Yeah, we are. So the pat, if you just were to, you know, the cheapest possible thing to do is to just take it out as a waste product and spread it over the quarry that we're getting our rock from. And if you do that, it takes about a full year to carbonate. Um, but uh, and but the advantage is it doesn't cost anything. Right, you have to put your waste product back in the quarry. Um, so this is essentially zero cost carbon negativity, which I think we all agree is good. Um, and if you know we were to use clean heat, like uh, from from you know John over at Rondo, then it would be an incredibly carbon negative process. VR process makes cement, and if we were to use dirty heat because that's what was available or cheapest, it would still typically be carbon negative because of the amount of magnesium we produce um, over you know over a year. You can certainly accelerate um, that by you know lot there's lots of technologies out there that have looked at magnesium hydroxide as quite reactive it's much more reactive than olivines or other things like that and you can get this down to days hours or even minutes depending on how um, if you want to amplify the amount of co2 that's in the um, in the stream if you want to do agitation if you want to um, make slurries and hydrate um, and we're definitely looking into those because they could allow us access to pots of funding that pay for for carbon negativity, for example, 45Q in the IRA. So there's there are, are active pieces of research, but I want to be clear, it's it's not needed because right? that's something that that increases the cost. But it if it it, 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 it we, we we are looking into it because there are certain scenarios, especially in the United States, where um, it adds value. And Cody, I, I, thanks for that. And I think earlier there was a, a direct question just about the Rondo manufacturing or the, sorry, Brimstone manufacturing and uh, how the heat would be provided and whether that, um, so I don't know if you had thoughts about the potential use of you know, decarbonized heat. Yeah, we're technology agnostic, right? So um, the, you know, our, our process could use any source of heat, whether that's electricity or hydrogen or coal, or you know, and this is our our our, our absolute preference is to use um, is to use renewable energy. We also want to be careful about a couple things. Like the first thing would be tying our process to another process that is a startup is risky, right? Because we don't need to use new technologies in order to be carbon negative. We use we could use our nightmare scenario of energy, which is what's available today, basically, right, and still be carbon negative, um, and it and 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 quite low cost. Um, but I'm really really encouraged by a lot of the technologies out there, especially Rondo, right? If you can get if you can get cheaper and zero carbon energy, then we can we could literally be sequestering a path to sequester a ton of CO2 per ton of cement produced, um, which would absolutely be our preference. But we are. We are um, carbon negative regardless, or for any reasonable fuel you would choose, <laughs> we are carbon negative. Um, and so, so, so in that way, we are, we are energy agnostic. And John, I think there was a, a question for you uh, related to seasonal variability of um, renewable electricity and, um, Spot on. Yes. How you address that and your thoughts on that? Yeah, spot on. So, you know, you build a solar farm in in California, you get a half as many megawatt hours in January as you do in July. The IEA just did an internal study; it's not released yet, looking at exactly that issue and asking what's the lowest cost way to get 100% renewable heat. Uh, and they picked Ludwigshafen, Germany, where there's a giant petrochemical plant, and the Mojave, one of the cement plants in the Mojave. 
And what they found was about 77% of the heat is going to be electric thermal storage and 20, 23% is going to be via hydrogen. And that's precisely because of seasonal variation, right? The hydrogen, yeah, it's a low efficiency pathway, but it's super cheap. You can store it long term. You know, what we're doing is good for storing energy for a few days. There's a couple of percent per day of loss. Uh, and the base case is just to run base load from intermittent power. And so if you have a non grid connected facility and you want 100% renewable heat, hydrogen is going to play a role. Along the way, as we go from today to 50 to 70 to 100, you're going to do electric thermal storage for the first 70%, and then the hydrogen is going to be the last infill, taking you the, way, the rest of the way to true zero emission. Yeah, that's, that is a, that's, that's one of the things that we find again and again. Now, it's, actually not, it's not actually quite true because all those analyses consider like a cement plant that has no connection whatever to the grid. California, like other areas, is beginning to have more and more of a summer peak in total electricity usage. And a cement plant that part of the time exported some of its electricity to meet grid demands, you might find that, you know, because of the seasonal shifts in electricity use, especially in Southern California, uh, that it might optimize out a little differently, but it's, you know, so it might optimize out at 85% uh, thermal storage and, you know, the 15 being hydrogen. But that today, practically, every single system that we're working on is a hybrid between existing combustion and electrical heat. And then over time, that combustion might become hydrogen combustion. Thanks. And Tom, I think I have maybe a, a question I can send your way. Uh, it states, it's our understanding that cement manufacturers may be reluctant to switch fuels to lower carbon intensity sources because of um, it could reopen yeah. Title V air permitting, uh, potentially requiring equipment upgrades. Um, oh. Is this true? <laughs> and if so, could there be accommodations made to allow fuel switching without reopening reopening Title V permits? So, sort of exploring, you know, potential barrier to low carbon fuels. Um, not sure if you have thoughts on that. Okay. Well, I'm I'm not really the expert on all those details, but what I do know is that our intention is to make sure that any change of alternative fuels is used with uh, within the existing parameters and if i could add one other thing it would be that we, we want to emphasize that senate bill uh, and by the way we're not reluctant to looking at alternative fuels that's something that's very clear it, it's it's part of our carbon neutrality plan we think it's part of the solution and lastly i just wanted to mention one thing it seems to me like we're we want to talk about what sb 596 does and what it says and it requires net zero cement used within the state, not just produced within the state. So this includes one of the most important features of the strategy, which is that it treats locally produced cement and imports in similar ways to reduce greenhouse gases. And right now with imports approaching 25% of cement consumption in California, it's only likely that allowance prices and regulatory costs will con continue to help that increase. So I just wanted to mention that too. It's one thing that's popped in my mind as we've been talking about this, but to reinforce it, we are uh, very much for uh, CARB's assistance along with other government entities to remove the hurdles to prevent any strategies from being implemented today, including alternative fuels. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I know there's been, you know, uh, a lot of consideration into those types of, of measures uh, by the industry. Um, and certainly, you know, switching to SB 596, uh, there's clear language there about cement use in California, um, considering the treatment of imports, and, you know, even I think specifically calling out a border carbon adjustment. Um, I think, you know, those are 
um, you know, well taken, and those are definitely part of the kind of development of measures, policies, and and maybe potential regulatory measures down the road. Um, I think part of the conversation here is really getting a feel for where we are, understanding some of the kind of technology options that are there for the production side. Um, and I think we want to continue. We want to continue on with some technical discussions going forward, um, and be avail. We as CARB staff want to be available for those um, as those kind of evolve into the more kind of policy oriented uh, discussions of what might be the best approach to support some of these these types of activities given the, the direction and the constraints that are in Senate Bill 596. Um, there's a question from uh, Christina uh, thanking the, the speakers, which uh, I second heartily. Um, she's saying there, there's promising innovations. Uh, many of these technologies won't be available in the near term. Some of the emission reduction interventions currently available happen at the concrete mixing stage. What's the emission reduction potential at cement plants in the near term? based on existing technologies and practices. Um, so, you know, I, I think Tom articulated earlier the, the kind of ongoing implementation of Portland limestone cement, a lot of the, the background work that went into kind of getting the green light for that. Um, you, we heard about some of the other technologies that are that are out there, whether it's it's decarbonizing electricity sources, the direct heat sources, the the um, potentially capturing the uh, process related emissions. Um, but I see see Cody with his hand up, but I also might want to request that Tom weigh in on on this one too, if that's okay. Go ahead, Cody. Uh, yeah. So. The near term is really interesting, I think. Um, I, I've seen quite a few of these, you know, there's several technologies that are sort of thought to be here near term, you know, LC3, um, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And I've tracked a lot of these sort of retrofit projects. Like one notable one is um, the Cementa retrofit in Sweden where they're retrofitting with carbon capture and sequestration. And that's technology we know how to do. It's you know we've been doing it for 100 years. It's aiming scrubbing. Um, they're going to make an investment decision, and they've started working on this you know before 2017. They're going to make an investment decision in um, 2026, and then if they do it, they expect the retrofit to take at least four years. Right? It takes two years to build a new cement plant. Um, you know, it, it, one of these one of the challenges is when you retrofit old plants, you know the operator doesn't want to shut it down, and it's very slow to retrofit things that are continue to operate. So these technologies that have, are available now actually take quite some time. And meanwhile, you know, John and I and others are, you know, I will be building, or our company will be building a plant, you know, this year and to, to, to be operating in 2024, we make relatively small quantities, and we expect to be building full-scale plants certainly by the end of the decade. The timeline really is the same. Um, and, and that's because we don't have to go through the hassle of retrofitting while a plant is still active. Um, and that's, uh, so that's I mean, an important distinction. Um, at least that's, that's what the data so far is. You know, I think it is theoretically possible if operators were willing to shut down a plant and retrofit, it could be faster to retrofit. But so far, projects um, are, are, are slower when they're retrofit. So these near-term solutions aren't as near-term as people think compared to you know, the newer solutions. And Mark, and I'll, I'll pitch in on the near-term solutions. One thing I didn't mention when we were talking about Portland limestone cement and blended cements is that we applaud Caltrans for approving the full suite of blended cements. That includes ternary blends. So that includes mixing two different supplementary materials 
for a, a blended cement. It could be limestone plus slag, limestone plus fly ash. There's different applications right there that are short term. Looking at things like uh, alternative fuels and all of that, we see those as being short term solutions as well. But the, we can't keep our eyes off the big ones either that take longer. And I think that's a segue to, you know, the carbon capture conversation, which, you know, uh, there's recent legislation uh, in California, a couple pieces of legislation giving some clear direction on carbon capture and sequestration uh, in California and, and giving some direction to CARB. So, you know, that's kind of being reflected in some of our current mentioned multiple times here as you know potentially an important part of the, the maybe well say midterm strategy um maybe not by 2030 because you know my understanding is a, a project like that is substantial it's um costly and it it requires um you know a, a host of uh planning activities and also just coordination across um, a lot of different groups to, to move forward. So, um, you know, I, I expect given, you know, what we're looking at with some of the cement manufacturing plants, we you know, saw a lot of slides about process emissions being 60%, two thirds of the total. Even if you're getting your heat from a perfectly zero carbon source, you're only cutting out you know 30 or 40 percent of the emissions uh by the by the portland cement process so um we kind of we see carbon capture as a you know a, a crucial part of meeting our you know statewide carbon neutrality goals and i think it it slots in especially well with the cement sector um in meeting the net zero ghg goals for sb 596 too so I don't know if you had, had further thoughts there on kind of timing of that, but I think the expectation is, I'm not sure what near term means, but probably not CCS in the near term, but 2045 is sort of feeling near term in the sense of uh, full net zero. And, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're gonna, we're expecting to need that uh, on that time frame for sure. Um, and maybe on that note, we're already a, a little bit past what we had planned to to do. Um, I just want to, you know, take a step back first. Uh, thank you to everybody on the screen and to Eric, uh, who weighed in with um, some really good initial material here. Um, I think, you know, we're. Uh, I hope people appreciate the the perspectives that are coming in we're, we're hearing a lot about potential options and i think there's just a lot of um well there's going to be opportunities moving forward for further conversations further discussions i just want to make sure again uh provide us your comments in in writing we're also available um phone calls emails uh to set up discussions to um uh, hear thoughts and um you know, gather more information. Um, there, there's likely data sources, information that we aren't aware of. So, um, if if you can recommend um, additional information for us to consider, um, that's that's going to be uh, very helpful as we you know you know we're getting this process started, and as we uh, work to carry it forward. So, thank you to the speakers. Um, Thank you to uh, the, the staff on the team who uh, wrestled with the technology uh, and were able to you know, make sure we had a venue to share thoughts. Um, I really appreciate everyone's attention um, and participation. Uh, invite you to continue that and uh, looking forward to um, you know, making progress on, on this bill. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a short time frame, so it's going to going to be moving quick. So thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you for the invitation and, and opportunity. Appreciate it.